Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Macon Bibb County Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Tuesday, July 12th, and the time is now 9 o'clock. We welcome everyone here this morning, and we'd like to officially call this meeting to order. First item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. I get a motion to approve. A motion by Mayor Pro Tem Clark and get a second. Second by Commissioner Bronson. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That uh, motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Uh, second item we have today are announcements. And uh, by way of announcement, we have a presentation of the comprehensive community plan. Um, we have several members that's going to be presenting that today, including uh, Ms. Laura Mathis and Greg Brown and others. Uh, we also have uh, several items on the agenda today um, that we'll go through. We will have a need to go into executive session today, and we'll do that at the appropriate time. And then we also have a work session that will be uh, happening in the mayor's conference room immediately after his executive session. Um, we'll come out, we'll adjourn the executive session, and then we'll go immediately into the work session, and the, and the meeting will be adjourned after the conclusion of the work sessions. But this time, I'd like to go ahead and call forward the presentation for the Comprehensive Community Plan. Ms. Laura Mathis. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm joined today um, by several members of the team from Macon Bay County Planning and Zoning and want to just um, do a quick overview of the Comprehensive Plan um, process, what the document is, and the process that's underway. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> the Comprehensive Plan is required of every city and county in Georgia and also every region to be a qualified local government, meaning that you are eligible for permits, grants, loans, and other programs operated by the state. Um, the idea is that it should shape your future and what the community looks like over the next, it's a long-term view of a 20-year planning cycle, but you're looking at it in five-year chunks. So casting a vision for what making it county could look like in the future and where you want future growth to occur. It also should be used in <clears throat> the planning process and for land use and zoning decisions. Zoning and, and land use in the comprehensive plan are different, but they should not be in conflict with each other. The current comprehensive plan was adopted in 2017. Um, so it's now time for your next comprehensive plan, um, which is due to the state to be accepted by the state and by you. The governor's authority by October 31st, 2022. And um, the Department, Georgia Department of Community Affairs, they established the schedule of uh, comrades plan updates. They set the regulations for what needs to be done and all of the requirements for the process itself um, to be carried out. Next. Comrades of plan used to be that it was like a 700, 800 page document not very useful to anyone. And so the state has streamlined the requirements. There is a vision section of the comprehensive plan that it, what is the community's vision um, for growth and development. And, um, and then there needs to be an analysis of needs and opportunities. And there are certain elements that are absolutely required based on the size and structure of Macon Bibb County. Um, you have a land use element, which is looking at how land is currently being used and what the future intentions are for use of the land. There's a transportation element because you are an MPO. Um, there's a housing element um, because you have the community development block grant program. Um, a lot of your work that you do around housing um, can be satisfied by those requirements. The new element that will be in all comprehensive plans going forward is broadband. It's never before been a requirement to be included in the comprehensive plan, so this will be your first time addressing that in the comp plan. Economic development element, and the goal is not really to reproduce or redo work that's already been done through other planning efforts, but to have everything be included and referenced um, in the appropriate section so that people who are doing that individual element work can have their plans reflected in the comprehensive plan. Natural and cultural resources, community facilities, and then the community can decide, Macon the County can decide if you want to include any other elements um, in your comprehensive plan. There's not a limit on what you can do, um, can include, but 
Sometimes our communities, for example, over in Jones County, their comprehensive plan includes education because they have very strong partnerships between the county, the school board, and the city of Gray. So they wanted to include education as one of their elements, um, but just as an example. After the analysis of needs and opportunities, there's another section that's really the heart of the comprehensive plan, which is your community work program. These are what are those specific items in each one of those different elements that the county intends or one of your partners intends to move forward with <coughs> over the next five years. And we'll talk a little bit about what those elements are. Next. I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Brown with Planning and Zoning to talk about the current plan process that's underway for an update. Good morning, Mayor and the Commission. Next slide. So, uh, as part of this comprehensive plan update, um, the most important part is to include the public. So um, we developed this particular uh, project um, public involvement schedule so that we can make sure that we are getting out to um, the public to uh, get the necessary input from each portion of the community regarding the update of this comprehensive plan. So our first uh, required meeting was held here in uh, council, uh, council chambers on May the 11th, 2022 from 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m. And that meeting was to inform the public about the plan, what we were gonna, uh, what the plan is, and how we were gonna go about developing the plan and also engaging the public. Our next series of public uh, workshops, they were all scheduled uh, at 5.30, from, from 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m. Um, so our first meeting was, was held on May 24th at the South Bib, in South Bibb, the Porter Ellis um, Center. And that meeting um, focused particularly on uh, community facilities and public safety. Um, our second public involvement workshop was held on June 2nd um, in North Macon at Lundy Chapel Baptist Church, and we were then talking about housing and also transportation. Our third meeting was held um, on June 23rd, and that particular meeting focused on broadband and economic development, and that meeting was held on the east side of town in East Macon at Kingdom Life Church. Um, our next meeting was held on July 7th, and that meeting um, focused on natural and cultural resources as well as land use. That meeting was held at the Macon Mall to, um, to be more accessible to those on the west side of the, the, the community. Our next meeting will, be, will not be a formal presentation, but it will be in the form of an open house, and that will be on July 26th um, at our office at Macon Bill Planning and Zoning Commission and we're scheduling that open house to be from 11 a.m. to 7 o'clock p.m. And um, we're gonna be encouraging the public or anyone to just drop in that day and if you would like to have input, we can sit down and have some dialogue with you uh, regarding the comprehensive plan update. And in addition to the public meetings, we also um, created a steering, uh, a steering committee. And that committee was made up of um, individuals with special interest in the community um, areas of expertise and uh, we've had at least two meetings so far may the 19th uh, june 15th our last steering committee meeting is scheduled to be held july 20th and those meetings uh, are scheduled like from two o'clock p.m to three o'clock p.m and um, also you have these visual uh, boards here at each of our meetings uh, we make sure we have these boards available uh, so that we can uh, conduct dot exercises. Um, we have a board down there that asks if you had $10,000, how would you prioritize it? Where would you spend it? This one uh, here talks about the vision statement of making Bill County. What do you think about this particular vision statement? Do you agree? Do you uh, don't disagree? And uh, these other boards here deals with, uh, we try to get feedback regarding what individuals are considering the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats about making Bibb County. And then the last uh, one ask a question like, making Bibb County will be a great place to live because, and you just write your, um, 
response down and place it there on the board. And then this particular board here up top, it has a, um, we can go to the next slide. I'll talk about that board at last. But in terms of, um, you can go back to the next slide. In terms of uh, drafting our plan, um, like I said, we, were going, we are uh, about to finish up the public involvement process in terms of getting out into the community. Our next step is to have uh, the draft plan updated by August the 5th, and we want to have that available for review. We can start taking comments on it. And then we're gonna come back for our second required public hearing on August the 11th. Um, once we have the second public hearing, um, we're gonna ask for comments uh, by August 15th. Once we receive those comments, if we receive any, we're going to uh, uh, planning to have the final draft ready and available for the regional commission by August 17th. Then the August, uh, from August 18th to September 26th, uh, the regional commission and DCA, the Department of Community Affairs, will have their review of the document. Uh, once they um, have reviewed the document and get it back to us, uh, we will make any type of necessary uh, updates and then we will uh, come back again before the commission, uh, the committee as a whole on October 11th for another presentation and then hoping it'll be adopted by the Board of Commission on October 18th. Next slide. So this, uh, we had a website dedicated specifically for this comprehensive plan. Uh, it's called makingbibcompplan.com. On that website, it uh, just keeps you up to date on the, the plan progress. And um, on that site as well, it has several links that, uh, th that displays our promotions, our outreach, trying to get the word out about the comprehensive plan. And uh, these images are just a few of the uh, images that were on um, the county's website, uh, the Georgia Informer, the Telegraph, uh, and, and, and some of the uh, local news stations' websites. Next slide. And about this particular uh, uh, board here that I was referencing earlier, uh, we developed this board uh, to try to uh, get as many people as possible to uh, complete a community survey. Um, this board has a, a QR code on it. If you can scan it with your phone, um, an online survey will uh, come up. Uh, the survey takes about 12 minutes, but if you just want to take your time to go through it, it'll take maybe about 20 minutes if you want to just make sure you read everything carefully. So we are, uh, have this, this survey, um, we're distributing this survey now uh, with the deadline to receive feedback by um, August 1st. So. Uh, this is the presentation in regarding to how we've been uh, going around each part of the community and also utilizing an online survey to help uh, gather feedback regarding the comprehensive plan. Next slide. We will have uh, Mr. Ken North to come up and um, make a presentation about the community work program. Hey, my name is Ken North. I'm with the Planning and Zoning Commission, and I'm here to talk about the Community Work Program. And could you go to the next slide, please? Mr. North, if you don't mind, if you'll speak up in that microphone. I'm having a hard time hearing you. I think people at home may be as well. Um, can you hear me? Um, the Community Work Program is part of our ongoing, ongoing efforts to complete the Macon Bibb County Comprehensive Plan. And this is a report that we do each year that is actually presented to the County Commission for approval. But uh, since we're updating our comp plan, we're going to be uh, able to do it as part of our comp plan. And it has to be approved along with the comp plan by October 31st of 2022. And um, if you may remember, this report is a listing of different short-term plans or projects that each 
local government or quasi-governmental agency hopes to implement over the next five years for Macon and Bibb County. Um, specifically what the community work program does is it presents specific measurable action items with the broad goal of improving the quality of life in the community. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a report that is actually done each year and it's presented to the Georgia Department of Community Affairs after it has been approved by Macon Bibb County uh, in order to qualify for various grant programs. Um, but this year, as I mentioned, it will be prepared as part of the comprehensive plan for Macon Bibb County. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a sample of the format of the um, community work program, which you may remember from uh, last year, which because it was approved by the uh, county commission. And what this will actually do is just list the separate capital projects for each uh, local governmental department, and it will provide a uh, provided project description along with the actual uh, local agency that is responsible for the capital project and prevent the uh, source of funding as well as the cost and the actual goal area for the capital project and it also gives a status of each capital project and this will be for the next five years and um, as i mentioned before this will be also included in our comp plan instead of presented as a separate uh, plan to the county commission and that's basically what i wanted to say about the community work program um, are there any questions at this time or all right thank you thank you next slide in addition to the local comprehensive plan that the county commission approves um, each region also has a regional plan our current plan and you have should have a, um, a handout at your seat that has our most recent implementation report that was adopted the current plan has a vision statement for our thriving middle Georgia. The, the idea is not to take the 11 comprehensive <coughs> plans that we have and mush them up into uh, the regional plan, um, but rather for us to look across, across all 11 counties to identify what are those common issues, needs, and opportunities that exist, um, and try and look at things across jurisdictional boundaries as opposed to just at the single county line. Next slide. Um, so the, we are required to have the regional plan by the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. It is adopted by the Regional Commission Council, has a public engagement process much like the local comprehensive plan. Our current plan was adopted in June of 2016. Normally we would have done a comprehensive, uh, excuse me, a regional plan update this year. Um, however, we ha have gotten a schedule adjustment for our regional plan, so our next regional plan won't won't be complete until June of 24. And that's because we're in the midst of every one of our local governments, all 11 counties doing their comprehensive plan and we wanted that planning process to be completed before we worked on the regional plan. Um, and then we also, um, one of the requirements for the regional plan is that we establish performance standards for the local governments that exist in our region. In middle Georgia, we have um, essential standards for what we think a, a good local government would do um, that are some core basic things that have to do with being qualified local governments as well as engaging in um, public engagement in the process of governance and then we also have communities of excellence where a community may go beyond just those essential standards and try and do something more we evaluate every one of our local governments on an annual basis making Bibb County is of course a community of excellence keep up the good work. Um, and that's because of the robust planning process that you have, but also the robust programs that you have from economic development to downtown redevelopment um, to addressing housing and blight as well as crime. Um, and there's also a regional work program. Again, these are things that touch multiple jurisdictions, 
and that try and address issues that are on a larger scale than just one single community. Um, so what you have as a, just a, a reference handout for you is our most recent um, report to the state on the implementation of our regional work program, and we do that every year um, for reporting back. That concludes our conversation um, about the local comprehensive plan that's underway right now, as well as the regional plan. We are happy to answer any questions that you may have or um, provide any more specific details. Thank you, Ms. Mathis, uh, Mr. Brown, and Mr. North. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Watkins? Yes, thank you. How you doing? Um, thank you for the report, and uh, thank you very much for the focus that y'all have been putting on uh, community engagement as part of the process. I guess I was not a critique at all. Uh, I, I think y'all are in the right spaces, the surveys, the, the getting out into the community. Uh, but I was just curious on the number of unique individuals that have attended the sessions or participated in the surveys. So if y'all had like a, like, a, like, a, like for the online survey, do you have a target goal in mind or expectation on who's going to respond by the 15th? Uh, yes, uh, the goal is to have 156,000 people in Macon Bill County to participate in our survey, but we do want a realistic goal of at least uh, um, uh, 1,500, 2,000 people. Right now, the online survey responses are low. Uh, there are only, as of this morning, there were 85 responses. So we're gonna continue to push this survey and hopefully um, each commissioner can um, help us out with that as well, as well as uh, from you know um, the local government perspective. In terms of our um, in-person public outreach sessions, um, th it hasn't been a lot of people coming out. Um, at our highest uh, outreach session, we may have had about 30 um, people, and that included um, staff as well as um, individuals from our steering committee. Like I say, it's not a critique. In fairness, I, when we do community town halls and things of that nature, we have the same, same experience. Right. Um, and I guess it, 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 it harms us in the sense of you're not hearing from a lot of voices that it's hard to gauge, it becomes harder to gauge on where to put y'all's limited time and focus when making a report. Um, and I guess to that point, like I, I have an interest in, uh, and I was just rereading over the, the, the housing section of uh, the current report. Um, and I think I've probably talked to each of y'all offline on, on the issue, but creating plans uh, like land use, if you want to go deeper in terms of like land use or creating uh, community development plans or having more details around the housing, in your opinion, would that be more dedication in this space or a separate standalone initiative? It would, be, it would have to be a separate standalone initiative. Um, and that type of conversation was, um, concerns were brought up in our public in-person outreach sessions as well. Um, a lot of residents were like, how can we have something done specifically for our community? So uh, that would be something that we can, um, as a staff at Planning and Zoning, we can look at uh, which community we can you know, target each year to try to put together a specific neighborhood redevelopment plan for um, any area throughout the community. I would appreciate that and would mind assisting in any way that's possible. I think that would be very positive for our community. And I, I thank you for your work. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Any additional questions from the commission? Thank you. From, from On behalf of Macon Bibb County Government, we appreciate all the hard work you do, your attempt to engage the community. I know this comprehensive plan takes up a lot of your time, effort. Certainly appreciate the presentation and all the, all the hard work we know goes behind the staff so it doesn't go unnoticed. So. Thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate the work and look forward to hearing back from you in the near future. Thank you. If you don't mind, uh, Mr. Four, if we could get, um, if we, we could go ahead and take these down, yes, sir. Commissioners, we have several uh, new alcohol beverage licenses to discuss this morning. Uh, we have nine specifically. We'll let you know that uh, we'll begin with item 3A. Item A is, uh, item one is listed for a recommendation of, for denial and uh, items two through nine, uh, which will be B through the rest of the letters, 
uh, are listed for recommendation by our, our attorneys as approval. Um, we've got Mr. Frank Howard here from the county attorney's office to give you information or answer any questions you have. Uh, the first item, like I said, is a new alcohol beverage license for 3737 LLC located at 3737 Mercy University Drive. Uh, and the legal recommends denial of that. And Mr. Howard will let you know the basis of that denial concerning a recent ordinance that we passed that went in effect on May the 1st. <coughs> Mr. And Howard. That is correct. Uh, the recent ordinance, Ordinance 22-011, uh, uh, enacted uh, ordinate, uh, Ordinance Chapter 26, Section 51, which requires a certificate of good standing to be supplied by both the applicant company and the owner of the property where the business location is located. Um, and that certificate of good standing is required to have an al to um, acquire an alcohol license. And it also shows that you are um, paid in full on your property tax, ad valorem property taxes in Macon Bibb County amongst other things. And uh, in this instance for uh, Mercer 3737 LLC located at business address 3737 Mercer University Drive. Uh, there are outstanding property taxes owed by the owner of that property of in excess $32,000 since 2018. And that coupled with the fact that there is no certificate of good standing from the owner uh, leads me to recommend denial of the application of, uh, for an alcohol license in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Howard. We do have a uh, recommendation of denial. Can I get a motion to accept that recommendation? Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Clark. Can we get a second? Second, second by Commissioner Mallory Jones. Uh, Commissioner Watkins, do you have a question? Um, I do, but it's not exactly relevant. Just I fully support what's happening. We have a motion and second. So no further uh, discussion relevant to this. Can we uh, take a vote? All those in favor of the motion of denial, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you very much. Mr. Watkins, do you have a follow-up? Yes, um, just because I think the, other, the rest on the agenda are, are, are fairly routine. I was, I was hoping, if possible, for an update on, I guess, the 11 o'clock rule and what's happening on Houston Avenue since we last met. I've seen a couple articles um, in the paper, so this update would be helpful. Um, sure, I, I can, I'll give a brief update. I'm not sure. That rule does not go into effect uh, for 30 days after it was signed uh, by, the, by myself. So the 11 to 6 will begin a, a completion of that. Letters going out to all, or going out to all the vice marts and food marts that were affected. Uh, the court did rule that that uh, particular business was a nuisance um, and found in favor of the county on all aspects of the case. The court did allow them to open up temporarily if they chose to, uh, with many restrictions on a temporary basis. Uh, to this date, my recollection is this, this particular store has not reopened yet uh, at all. And we look forward to uh, the 30-day the time to elapse so we can begin the 11 to 6 closures for all those marks. And, and so far, early indications on crime in that area appear to be very positive. Uh, when does the 30, can you, can you remind me again on the, the 30 days lapse? You say 11 6, that was, that's not 30. Uh, the I, I, I might have misheard you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's the uh, meeting we had. What, what's the last meeting we had we voted on? We had was uh, in June, and that was, uh, the I believe, the third Tuesday in June. But I, I defer to uh, – June 21st, so it would be uh, July 21st will be the 30-day. 30, the 30 I believe we signed that that night or the next day. Okay, but and if I understand it right, there's one – oh, 11 to 6, that was the time. Okay, okay, I was thinking you were saying the date. Um, but there was one store um, on House and Avenue that went to court about it. That, that's the one I just gave you a report on, friends. But, and you're saying they never – they still haven't reopened, so that's correct. kind of a mute point. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Commissioner Tillman? Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, elaborate on that. <clears throat> I uh, spoke recently with uh, you, Mr. Mayor, and the sheriff, and was trying to get some more information on that. Uh, I think, I think some, I think I would love to have more discussion on that, uh, on, on this particular issue, as far as how do we derive at closing down stores, and particularly how did we uh, obtain the services of uh, the former DA David Cook uh, to go to court on our behalf? 
I've never received an update on that. Uh, and I do think it's a conflict of interest because he personally uh, sued uh, some of those stores that had gambling machines in it. Uh, ultimately, he lost. Uh, Judge Culpepper recently ruled, and this store has permission to open back up, true enough, with uh, uh, things that they provide the same way that we did on Mount Pier. So uh, I, I, at some point, I think we need to be able to discuss these things because I do think it's a conflict uh, because his even former opponent, he right before he left office, tried to indict a lot of these folks. And so uh, I know that a lot of this stuff comes to the attorney's office, but I have not received an update had, or had heard. But I do think it's a conflict, and I'm glad that Judge Culpepper, and I know his wife well, she represented me, I ended up with custody of my son, uh, and I know he ended up doing the right thing. But these particular issues uh, like this, I would like to have more discussion on. Uh, I did want to add some other things to the agenda, uh, but I didn't want to, um, I, I want to wait until the, the end to see how far this goes. Uh, but those are concerns about that because that's one of the high crime areas that I know the MVP uh, is targeting and that I'm part of trying to go to and resolve some of those issues. But um, if I could say this, uh, I don't condone any violence on any level, and especially when we have murders, those things come to our attention more so. But uh, I don't think we're in the business of wanting to close down taxpayers for doing business with us. We're not closing down Pansy Avenue because we have murders over there. Yes. We are not closing down um, uh, Gray Highway, Pine on the Avenue, Eisenhower, because pedestrians are constantly getting hit and some are getting killed over there. And so we've got to set a precedent of what this commission wants, not what individuals want, and see as we're going to be targeting uh, these taxpayers because uh, we know what happened a couple of years ago when uh, one of those stores was robbed and the entire uh, community basically of these convenience stores shut down and marched in front of City Hall and people couldn't buy gas that day. And so we wanna be careful when we began to do this and have the whole commission involved in this. And I yield. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, just a couple things for clarification. Number one, the, the court did rule that this is a nuisance there this body of government did vote unanimously to close these stores from 11 to 6, and uh, certainly there is no legal conflict uh, for anyone representing us in this matter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using them on the advice of our council. But that w that's a conversation not proper form to have uh, here in open public. We'll be happy to discuss those once again with you uh, in the proper form. So we're going to move on to items B. Mr. Mayor, if I, if I could follow up. Uh, no, sir. <coughs> I item B. New alcohol license for making Crab House LLC located at 4599 Presidential Parkway. We have a motion to recommend it for approval. That is my motion. Can I get a second? Yeah, I'm not going to allow that right now, Commissioner. We have a second. We got a second for Commissioner Jones. Uh, we have a, any questions on that particular item? We'll come back to you, Mr. Commissioner. We've already voted on that item. Uh, we have a motion and second. Uh, on this particular item. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Uh, we're going to move on to item C. Item C is a new alcohol for initial Gormit DBA Chevron 275 located at 997 Gray Highway. That is my motion. Can I get a second? second. Got a second by Commissioner Tillman. Any discussion regarding that item? Here, no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Item D is a new alcohol beverage license for Healy and Gia LLC Texaco Food Mart located at 4476 Omega East Boulevard. Uh, attorneys recommend approval. Can I get a motion to approve? Motion by Commissioner Jones. Can we get a second? Second by Commissioner Howell. Any discussion regarding that item? Here, no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Item E is a new alcohol license for a Mo Romizer Food Mart. Nay, okay. Sorry about that. Item E is a new alcohol license for a Romizer Food Mart, DBA Root High, 2022 LLC, located at 49 
61 Romizer Drive. Uh, that is my motion. Can I get a second? Second by Commissioner Jones. Any discussion regarding that particular location? Hearing no objection. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Item passes and present the consent agenda. Item F is a new alcohol beverage license for Conjay DBA Shooters Bar located at 4755 Chambers Road. This is inside the Ramada Inn there. Uh, that's my motion to approve. Can we get a second? Second by Commissioner Tillman. Uh, any discussion on that item? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Item G is a new alcohol license for Hilltop 2022 DBA Valero Food Mart located at 3726 Jeffersonville Road. Uh, that's my motion. Can I get a second? Second by Commissioner Jones. Any discussion? Hear no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Uh, that was uh, Commissioner Bronson. Item H is a new alcohol license for Bass Spirits and Cigars located at 5451 Bowman Road, Suite 260. Uh, the motion is for approval. I get a motion to approve. A motion by Commissioner Jones. We have a second. Second by Commissioner Howell. Any discussion? Hear no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Item I is a new alcohol license for Bass Package and Cigars located at 1687 Bass Road. As my motion, can I get a second? Got a second by Commissioner Howell. Any discussion regarding that item? Hear no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously be sent to the consent agenda. Okay, we're back with you, Commissioner Tillman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, at some point, I, I think we, I don't know the time that we have a full agenda. Uh, I would like to, uh, get a couple of items on for discussion. If we don't have time, I, I may start to uh, do more of the personal privilege, but uh, based on the agenda, if we're gonna have time, I'd like to possibly have a little bit more discussion on that item. Uh, discussion on the Greyhound bus station that we uh, obtained and demoed. I was not aware that we even bought that property. And if I'm wrong, then we'll be able to discuss it and correct me on that. And the other item is the Board of Election uh, issue as far as uh, that appointment of the uh, supervisor. That's some information that I recently found out. If we can at some point today, if we have time to just put those on the agenda to discuss them at the end of this agenda, uh, I'd love to uh, have a discussion on those items. And I yield. Commissioner Tillman, we'll be discussing those items, but we'll not be out here in open forum today. Commissioner Lucas. Um, I just want to echo what Commissioner Tillman is asking, and I want to express my displeasure at you, um, your handling of that particular situation. When an elected official requests information, uh, it is appropriate for it to be acknowledged and for that person to be allowed to express him or, or herself, especially in this democratic uh, assembly that we have. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is I'm concerned that the former DA, I know that within the legal department they do have a line item for outside attorneys and I'm assuming that that's you know the line that's being used for uh, acquiring folks to do handle cases that are um, in-house legal department does not um, feel like they have either the time or the expertise to handle. I do have a concern about the former DA. Uh, it is obvious to me that there are attempts to try and place him in a public position to run again against our present uh, DA. I think that's a misuse of our time and county resources. That's me talking. You can disagree if you like. That's your 
privilege, but I certainly would like a little bit more information on several of the topics that have been asked about in whatever form. Or form. If you determine in the county, the other attorneys determine that the information should be shared in a closed session, then that's fine as long as it's shared. And we're given the rationale for us being behind closed doors discussing uh, what some would determine would be public kinds of stuff that uh, doesn't need to go behind closed doors. But I'm especially concerned um, because I know that with Macon's attorneys, all of the attorneys that we have, and we have some very fine ones uh, that would love to work and represent Macon Bibb County in these different situations, that we end up with um, uh, this kind of situation, which in my estimation is politically um, uh, motivated. Maybe that's not the word, but that's what it boils down to. Uh, I'm speaking for me, not anybody else, but I do concur with uh, Commissioner Tillman's assessment on a number of things and look forward to getting that information at the appropriate time. Thank you, Commissioner Lucas. And I, I will tell you from a personal standpoint, this has nothing to do with politics, uh, strictly with experience in the nuisance. Uh, as, and I've also spoken with the, the district attorney on this case prior to uh, retaining the services of, of Mr. Cook, but we will have that discussion today. It will not be out in the, in the public section. I have, yes, ma'am. That's the only one I know of that's been elected. Yes. Yeah, we will. We, we can. We will certainly have that conversation today, Commissioner Lucas. Commissioner Watkins. I, I'm not sure if a second is in order for uh, Commissioner Tillman's motions, but I was in favor of having further discussion added to the agenda on the Board of Elections and the Greyhound um, Station and also support any further conversation on outside council. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll discuss that after the executive session. All right, we're gonna move on to appointments, reappointments to authorities, boards, and committees. Uh, item 4A is a resolution of the Macon Bibb Commission reappointing Joe Robson as a member of the Region 5 Emergency Medical Services Council. Uh, you received your entire package on that. This is a re uh, reappointment, I believe. Um, that is sponsored by myself. Can I get a second? Got second by Commission, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Clark. We have a motion and second. Any discussion regarding this particular item? Here, no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Item B is a resolution of the Macon Bibb Commission appointing John Goolsby to the Fort Hawkins Board. That's my motion. Can I get a second? Got a second by Commissioner Lucas. Any discussion regarding Mr. Goolsby? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the Fort Hawkins uh, Commission. It's been in operation a long time. Uh, Fort Hawkins is a real treasure, especially for those folks who are history uh, buffs, and it, it, it should get more exposure, uh, especially uh, with, uh, from the schools, but to the schools. But I'm concerned about um, the fact that there's not a lot that's happening and most of the time when I pass by the gates are up and there are no cars there so at some point we might need to kind of look at what's happening because they do act on behalf of Macon Bibb as far as running that and um, I don't know what the present setup is I don't know what what the problems are, but I know that we have invested over the years uh, county funds, city and county funds, so I'd like to see it function over there, the birthplace of banking. I agree, Commissioner. I've got some concerns as well. I think we're trying to address that with board members. There's been a large turnover of board members. I do know that there's been some recent activity and requests, and there will be several more um, board member recommendations coming for you in the next couple of meetings. Uh, we're vetting those, those members out right now. Uh, it require, uh, uh, allows up to 11 members, I believe, on that board, and we, mm -hmm. we've had very limited activity, but the, uh, the new folks that have been, get, have been involved here recently have 
uh, acquired some property nearby that location as well to protect it, which leads me to believe that they've got some plans for that area. So I hope to bring some more board members to you in the near future. Well, they've been looking at that a, a, a while, but Mr. Goolsby, I have no problem with him. He's been on there, I believe, from the very beginning and has served well. But one person can't carry the, the right. load, so we just need to make sure that that board is functioning. No, Thank I agree. you. I agree. We do have a motion and second. There's no further discussion. We'll take a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Item 5A, this is contracts for implementation or renewal. This is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute a purchase and sales agreement with Becker Arena Products. This is a purchase of Arena Deck for the ice floor uh, system located in the Coliseum, $185,215 to be paid from 2018 splice funds for culture and recreation. That's my motion. Can I get a second? Got a second by Commissioner Bronson? Commissioner Bronson, any discussion regarding this item? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries. Item B is a resolution of the Macon Bibb County Commission to authorize the mayor to execute a quick claim deed for the sale of property for Macon Bibb County Transit Authority, approximately eight hundredths of an acre located at the dead end of Kassan, if that's the saying that Ryder Kaysen, for the fair market value of $10,261.00. Uh, we'll have our attorney get some information. As you recall, we did a similar uh, purchase a few weeks ago. This will require a public hearing that will be scheduled at the same time or right after the hearing for Anthony Road renaming on next Tuesday. Uh, so just give us a little information about this and, th and this item as well as item C uh, are, are connected together. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, commissioners. Mayor Miller, the Macon Transit Authority has put in a second petition to, por to purchase the a portion of Cason Street that abuts their property on all three sides up to its intersection with Spike Street. You may recall that the Transit Authority put in a previous petition to buy a portion of Cason Street. However, they did not determine to purchase all of that portion of Cason Street at that time due to one non-Transit Authority property owner. They have since closed on that property and now own all properties abutting all portions of that block of Cason Street. So they're hoping to finish out that block and own up to Spike Street. So we have a resolution abandoning that that portion of Cason Street as item 5C that uh, you may wish to consider along with this item, 5B for the actual sale of that property for its fair market calculated value of $10,000 and certain extra monies. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. Board members, you've heard um, the explanation of this particular road. We do have a hearing set for next Tuesday, uh, but right now our recommendation is to approve this and that is my motion. Can I get a second? Got second by Commissioner Jones. Any discussion or questions regarding this item? Hearing no questions, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda pending hearing. Item C is a resolution of the Macon Bibb County Commissioner authorized mayor to close and abandon a portion of Quezon Street and to remove such path from the official roadmap of Macon Bibb County. This is contingent to the property we were just talking about. I believe they will own all the property on this road and that would be the reason to do that. Uh, that is my motion. Can I get a second? Second by Commissioner Howell. Uh, any discussion regarding that item? Hear no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to the consent agenda. Item D is a resolution of making Bibb County Commission authorizing the mayor to execute an amendment to, to the task release agreement for with Hofstetter and Associates to provide additional operation activity during the preparation and closure of the Walker landfill for the additional fee of $1,482,386.23 payable out of the 2018 splice revenue. Uh, we've also sent you a breakdown of those fees so you can look and see what that uh, fund, uh, how that gets computed there in your packages. This is part of our closure that we continue to do and we mentioned before when we did this first plan with Hofstetter that we bring back uh, any additional monies that are unaccounted for to you for your approval. Uh, so that's my recommendation. Can I get a second? Second by Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Watkins, you have a question? Um, so excuse me, my, my board docs wasn't operating up until yesterday afternoon. Um, 
Could you go over a little bit what, like, so this is the second amendment. What was the original amount of the task order number four? Give me one second, Commissioner, let me pull it up. You want to know what it was for or the amount? I'm sorry, Commissioner Watkins. Oh, yeah. Well, both will be fine. Can I get this one back? Mm -hmm. I need my phone yeah. to pull up that email. Yeah, well, basically this is just a continuation of preparing the landfill to close. The landfill has been a challenge. <laughs> the bi one of the bigger challenges was just water itself. So we've actually lowered the water around the landfill which is going to help in the closure of the landfill and the post closure of the landfill and i know this sounds silly but i feel like we've drained water uphill to get it flowing downhill but basically all this is a continuation of getting this this landfill ready for proper closure and then we plan on having that all bid it out by the end of the year and then next year will be the actual closure of the landfill He's absolutely correct. Uh, one thank you to Hofstetter and Associates for working with us. Our last grade from EPD was actually a 95. So we are um, doing better in working with EPD. Thanks for doing better in getting the um, landfill um, ready for closure. Um, you approved the 2.7 million in the first four set of tasks. Um, that was assist operating for 489,000. Reconfiguring the landfill, the slopes, we explained to you that we had to take it from a one to two slope to a one to three. That was 1.8, and then removing screening and storing the, um, the dirt necessary for was about 400,000, and then testing, which was about 10 grand. Where we are now is to get us through the end of the year. What I had to do was I had to remove staff at the landfill to help with other solid waste things such as the bins and the convenience centers. And because of things that were going on with EPD, Matt Roper in association with Hoff Center Association I turned over operating the landfill primarily to them to get us through the EPD um, issues, which were about five or six, which they, as I say, the last grade was a 95. And this would get us to the end of the year. In your um, document, it gives that breakdown of what it's costing to get us to the end of the year. And those tasks will help us reduce the um, expected cost when we put the RFP out, and I believe RFP be out in about what, four months? Yes, sir. For the um, actual closure. And so we are in good, we, we're looking good. EPD is happy. Um, right now it is closed to the public, but we are taking our waste at the convenience centers up there, which is helping continue to build that slope and reinforce those areas. Um, if you notice, we've had, every time it rains, we're exposed to leachate outbreaks. They are on top of that and working with that. And as he said, because of the bowl, if you want to remember that bowl we had up there, they've had to go up and shore that up up top. They've had to do an enormous amount of grassing to get the grass to grow to prevent the erosion. And as you can see, I'm learning more about this landfill than I, I probably want to know. <laughs> but he's the expert, and he can tell you. Did I say anything wrong? No, no, everything's okay. right. All right. I mean, so, all, and everything we're doing is required by EPD. So we're Thank you. You carried me, you carry me quite, quite fast on that journey. Um, but I can tell from you guys' enthusiasm that you are knowledgeable in what you're working on, and based on your tone, it seems to be going well. So just, so again, I'm just reading tone and body language because a lot of what you mentioned went over my head, and I don't have quite the visual well, the, of the, it. But in yeah. general, what I would like to know, though, like I know today, we originally we had a task order number four, correct, and this is an amendment to task order number four. The original task order number four amount was when originally approved was. Point seven. Point seven. Seven. And that was all the tasks together. That's one through four. Right. So right. and, and I'm sorry. And we appropriated all this. This has already been appropriated. The reason why I'm before you now is because the addition to the contract procurement, we have to do a change order. And this change order, 1.4, is greater than 20% of the original cost. That's why you have to approve this. Right, right. Change. So, so walk me through what is in what needs to be added to task number four, or it, 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 based on what you're saying, it sounds like this isn't so much a specific thing that needs to be completed. That's creating an additional thing for task order number four versus 
you're just continuing to do the work as processed and just a continuation of the things that we've already been doing you know we're finding unknowns so we're having to address a lot of unknowns out there and the weather we're having to fight the weather um, it, it's, it's been quite a challenge out there right so in the document you were yeah. to pull up it's, it's, it's broken down from January to May that's about 400,000 the June 200,000 from July to December 588,000 mm -hmm. so that's the continued operation for the mm -hmm. year so what we've done this year and to get us to the end of the year so this will cover us through December of this year yes sir uh, up to it is their goal to have the RP out prior to December mm -hmm. so we can go ahead and get the contractor in to start closing so, and task so I would assume that task order number four concludes with an RFP being put on the street Correct. That's correct. Okay, correct. Once and we, we expect to do that by December. That's correct. Okay. And then we'll have a contractor under contract, and then it, it will be his responsibility to close the landfill and address whatever items that come up because of the weather. Okay. All right. And I guess just, and I'm, 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 I'm certain that the answer is, I'm, I'm obvious, but just so, just to, for the record, this is still within the original budget amount. I mean, oh yes, sir. Right, yes, sir. We, yes, sir. We, yes, sir. Still plenty in the splashed account to continue moving forward. Because right, it's already been appropriated. Right. We just need to do the change order to, to get things continued. And one, I'm sorry. One last thing. I, I, when you were saying that part of the issue was that our solid waste, I guess in-house solid waste department, has moved away from the well, the landfill section has moved away from the landfill. And you said they were doing what? I, I kind of lost you. The mic kind of uh, muffled. Remember the the strike team we have with solid waste. Though that team that's left with solid waste, I've been using them to do other things, uh, to include running the convenience centers. So the six or seven guys that were working primarily the landfill, because of issues that we had in training and using equipment and everything, uh, Matt Roper's team is able to do that more efficiently. So we're using them more at the landfill and using the guys at the landfill for the convenience centers and for other solid waste items. If I heard you right, it's a staff of six or seven? Right, that we're at the landfill. Okay, so and that's so what happens with landfill, I mean convenience center number two? Uh, it should be open. At that point, or would they be able to split again? That's the, we, we're gonna. Yeah. It's under we, construction. It's right? under construction, should be done in about two months. We'll be using them, and in the budget, we uh, approve part-time labor to kind of help that because convenience center number two in Lazella and number three over off Montpelier, may not have the same hours as number one, but we're working on staffing that right now. So, but my understanding is two would definitely be, well, I won't say definitely, but two <laughs> has a goal of being open within the next 60 days. Yes, sir. Information, good information, thank you. Now, I don't know if you've been to convenience center number one, but I think it's running very well too. Yes, sir. I know. Thank you, I appreciate all your hard work and thank you for that 95. It's been a long time since Macon Bibb County has received a high score uh, at the landfill so we certainly appreciate we understand it requires a certain expertise to operate those things and I, I will tell you I've had many many compliments on uh, the convenience center one uh, the staffing there has been wonderful and they've been really taken care of we've had a couple times we had to close down for weather for a short period of time but people enjoyed the opportunity to be able to go there seven days a week and it works around their work schedules real nicely so we do have a motion and second to approve this item uh, all those in favor of the motion please say aye opposed nay that motion carries and will be sent to the consent agenda. Item E is a resolution of making Bibb County Commission to authorize the mayor to execute an installment agreement with Dell Financial Services LLC in the total amount of $2,385,000 payable over three years for countywide Microsoft Windows Server and Office Suite Enterprise software licenses to be paid from the information technology budget, repairs and maintenance software. Uh, that is my motion. Can I get a second? Got a second by Commissioner Bronson. Any questions regarding that item? Hearing no questions, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Uh, item six uh, is acceptance of grants, and we have several of those on the agenda as well. I think four. A resolution of making Bibb County Commission authorizing acceptance of a juvenile justice incentive grant uh, for 402896 with no local match. Can I get a motion to approve? Motion by Commissioner Jones. Can we get a second? Second by Commissioner Wilder. Uh, any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you. That motion carries. We sent the consent agenda. Commissioner Lucas, you have a question? Yes, 
I think there is someone here to say something about this, and this is real <laughs> important. I think she, so, she's here in case there's any questions, but I well, guess if you want it, her to say something, she, could she can. Just say something about sure. each one of these, because we, you know, generally we don't discuss it unless it's an item on the Good morning. agenda. Good hey. morning. Good morning. How you doing? I'm just here, here for the juvenile justice right. incentive grant. Uh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, that one. <laughs> Seventy-three youth. Um, the the bonus to this program, this is we're going into our 10th year, and this allows a kid placed on probation to have counselors go into the home, and they also incorporate the parents, so it's not just for the child, and that's been a component we have missed for years, but um, this provides it. So we get whoever the guardian, if it's not a parent, we have them incorporate them. It lasts three to six months. They teach them an array of skills help the family also with any other resources that they may need, housing, or if the mothers or the fathers or the guardian have other issues, they will assist them with food stamps, welfare, insurance, anything that they need, they assist them outside of the scope of the basic counseling. So that's been a, a huge benefit for us. It is very successful. We have decreased our rates of outdoor home placements also. We have gone from hundreds of youth being detained to a minimum of mm. under 40 youth a year. So that's been a huge plus for us. Okay, how many staff members are hired um, from this particular grant? Well, we have a contract with EBA and EBA has a contract with Grace Harbor. For Bibb County, I have one supervisor and two actual counselors that work specifically for Bibb. Each counselor can carry a caseload of 13 at one time, so it's a consistent, a constant rotation. Okay, if, um, if I wanted to get some more information, is there a uh, social media? Is it, can, can I go somewhere and get, where would I go? Just pull up Grace Harbor on the internet. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if EBA has a specific site or if they're interrelated, but I can get you any any additional information you would like if you would like print offs. Okay, who who evaluates the degree of effectiveness of Grace Harbor the Carl and In the others? I'm sorry, who, the Carl who? Vincent Institute of Georgia. And then they report. To the, to they can report to the to courts and to EBA. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Watkins. So I was curious about the, this, how did you come, no. If, if money wasn't an issue, how many, like, you mentioned that your caseload was 73. How many community would be eligible or qualify for such a program and could you explain like what is a qualifying youth okay for juvenile court for us it's a youth that has to be adjudicated which means they're basically found guilty guilty they don't have to have a disposition which means sometimes a judge can adjudicate and withhold disposition if they get a disposition nine times out of ten is probation community service the basics if they withhold disposition they may say you know if you complete this program with counseling then we can look into you know, shortening your time on probation. So they give them that option. But also in addition to that, they have to meet a predisposition risk assessment. It's something that the Department of Juvenile Justice submits. They have to score a two or above on that in addition to being adjudicated to be able to receive those services. And there's a lot of things at play. If you, if you had to, I don't know, maybe you know exactly, but like, Based on the risk assessment and the number of youth that um, I guess are found guilty each year, is it that 73 number last year or is it? That's always. It's higher or? A consistent rotation, it's really hard to say. We just pick a number over the years that we sit there and just look at statistic wise. So it's a interaction between Carl Vincent Institute, EBA and myself, and we look at the number of youth that come into our courts. You know, in some months you have a lot, some months you don't. But I usually try to get a minimum of four referrals a month if that's like that's our goal if we're looking at tracking youth. So we try to see those that are coming in that may not qualify, 
but if they get another charge, we can try to intervene. If they get another adjudication, we can request the judge withhold that disposition, just keep them on the current order, but they'll get a new PDRA that might score them enough to get them that service. And then we can, you know, negotiate on the child's behalf to see if we can prevent them from being on probation longer than necessary. And I, I assume the, the program, like if, you, if we review that, I, I'd love to see it. I think you showed okay. it to me before, but um, the the rates of success are much higher for kids that go through the program than not. For what we're seeing, it it does um, it is an is to prevent them from re offending. Mm -hmm. Some kids, it, it doesn't work, and it doesn't work for everyone. But we've sort of worked back and forth. We can see a kid and try to track. And if we have to pull out of that program, which means that they might not be able to continue because they've run away or left home or they've committed another offense, we'll try to flag them within each other, pull them back out of that, that program. And then once we get them back around, we can submit them back into that program and still sort of try to negotiate, not putting them on probation as long and see what we can do to get those services in that home and in our, um, like the other services with what's going on with school. Right now it's a little difficult with school being closed, but so far it seems to be working because we haven't had that many youth come back to reoffend. That's good, that's good. It's been in, great. In, in, the, in the city now, like if you had to spitball it, two risk assessment, two or higher, inside of 100 or much more than that? Oh Lord, it's just so hard to say. I would, I would say it can go from 100 to 200, just depends. Because we look at it differently. We see a lot of kids that are coming in, and then they might not want the, the juvenile justice and send grant, mm -hmm. which is FFT, Functional Family Therapy. That's the actual program that they receive, the actual service. Okay. And you have a lot of parents that don't want to do it. So there's a lot of going back and forth and running in circles just to try to get the service in place, because a lot of people aren't receptive at first. And a lot of people don't want others in their business. They want to be as private as they can. But we, we seem to have worked it out to let them know that we're not there to report everything that's going on in their home. Ms. Griffin doesn't want to know what's going on in your home. We just want to know that you're getting the service and that they are helping you and they're making contact with you and doing their job. Cool. I, th I thank you for your time. Yeah. And I'll get you some information. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Uh, Commissioner Tillman? Uh, thank you. I'd love to have your contact information. Uh, was not expecting to see you today. So glad Commissioner Lucas called you up. Uh, most folks don't know I'm a former DJJ officer. Yes, sir. Uh, under the leadership of Lieutenant T, who now works for the Sheriff Department. And we call him Lieutenant T because we can't Got pronounce you. that uh, African name of his, Got but you. he was my lieutenant at DJJ. Uh, so much has changed it has. and what I'm hearing and I just hear your demeanor because uh, the training I still recall it and remember it uh, going through post uh, but that number under 40 is so important uh, that I'm hearing today yes, uh, sir. certain subjects that we have on the agenda we don't know what's gonna take up time this is very important um, if you can, two questions I have, uh, and I want to make another comment. Well, I'll make the comment first. Okay. So much has changed since the administration at the DA office changed prior to uh, former DA Cook okay. and uh, DA Howard. P prior to their administration, we had and saw so many uh, youth being detained in jail for the seven deadly sins and being tried as adults. And folks, some folks don't, want to, don't understand that language. You do. Yes, sir. And I do. Uh, question, can you explain to the public the point system? Because folks get frustrated. Why is that youth not in detention? He or she just did this. If you can, the point system. And if you know how many under that 40 may be under the seven deadly sin uh, number. And if you don't know, that's fine. I'd love to get with you. Okay. But the point system, I think, is important for folks to understand because when a child commits a crime and he or she does not go right to juvenile, there's a new point system in place where you just don't lock up every child. 
Exactly. <laughs> and I can speak a little bit because I, I don't do the point system with DJJ. I know how it runs okay. and how it occurs. And of course, the more serious the offense, the more points. Right. And it depends on whether that child has been detained prior to and whether that child is committing the same offense. So there's a lot of things in play. Some kids can get placed on probation for motor vehicle theft, and they're out doing good, they're on probation. And in that probation order, it may say no graduated sanctions right. on car thefts. No graduated sanctions is a part of probation. That's what the probation officers monitor. Right. So when that child comes across again for another motor vehicle theft, and that officer pulls up to do those points, of course, more than likely, they're going to point out and go get in lockup. Right. But we have parents and others that sometimes want to know what the point system is that are trying to get their children points. Right. It's not just that they're getting points. They're like, I want this child out of my house. I'm tired right. of dealing with them. We're like, well, ma'am, you can't just put your child out. Right. You know, I'm a mother. I can't put my children out. It's just it comes with the right. territory. Right. But you have a lot of parents upset at that moment yeah. that just wants a child out of their house. Right. And, and for the sake of time, okay. uh, Mr. Mayor and Madam Clerk, I don't know if it's possible. We probably need to have a work session on this because part of the challenge that the mayor's MVP plan is uh, going toward is these youth and juveniles. And I think we all and this community need to understand how the juvenile system works and especially the point system, because if a child has committed a crime, a lot of folks don't understand that, just like she said, there's a point system. I can't put my child out. I want him in juvenile. He just did this. And, and I think it would be great to kind of include it in the MVP process uh, to either do a work session publicly and to schedule it. So, you know, some information that I may be privy to or she's privy to that we don't understand because y'all are hearing language in this public that they have no idea about when it comes to youth and these are the people we're trying to save. Exactly. The seven deadly sin is a process that y'all need to understand that that's how the yes. two, the, the district attorneys before Cook and Anita Reynolds Howard were charging kids as adults. And a uh, former judge, uh, uh, she's, a, she's a female, uh, God. Uh, but I got into this thing through uh, uh, Mindy Benderman in, in Atlanta and uh, uh, the judge whose who's son, she, she's a woman, she swore me in at the NACP. But there are more, there are 13 youth around the world that was charged as adults. And in the United States, there were over 2,000. And, and Dr. Cujo has been advocating for, um, it's either Senate Bill 440 or 441 to try and change it. Nobody's ever challenged it on the state level. No attorney has ever challenged that we're uh, sentencing these kids. Uh, life without parole, under the age of 17. There are many, many kids, over 2,000 life without parole, but the medical statistics, statistics say that a child brain does not fully form until age 21. So there's a lot of information about juveniles and understanding some of the youth that we're trying to deal with that you guys have that we don't have, but I want to yield because it is a sensitive subject and I love discussing and talking about it. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank you. And I, can I say one thing? We do, we do not want to lock up any more juveniles than we have to. We do everything that we can to avoid that. There's, we go ab above and beyond, yeah. I feel like, here in our community. I, I think it will help with our MVP uh, folks model to understand it. Okay. And we may need to carry them through a system, and I won't gonna get with the, with the mayor, that make them, under, get them to understand some of this stuff. Why kids, there are kids out here being prostituted. Oh yes sir, sexually trafficked, abused, yes sir. Trafficked. That little tough boy and that little girl standing in the corner won't move out the street. Yes. We have no idea what they're going through. We had a juvenile but, sex trafficking. But traffic we say, several. oh, that little fast girl, but she's a child. Yeah, and that adult absolutely. is doing something to, to bring that out of her. So it's so much information uh, when it comes to that. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you.
thank you, Mr. Tillman, and thank you, you for being here and answering those questions. And uh, we did have a motion to second that pass, and it will be sent on consent agenda for final approval next week. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Going to move on to item B, which is a resolution of making Bibb County Commission authorizing acceptance of the Judicial Council of Georgia American Rescue Plan Act funding grant in amount of $259,000 with no local match. Uh, these are funds that they apply for themselves. Uh, these funds are something that we need to accept on their behalf. And that's why it's on your agenda, specifically a grant for them. So we uh, that's my motion. Can I get a second? Second by Commissioner Jones. Uh, any questions regarding this item? Hearing no questions, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Item C is a resolution of making Bibb County Commission authorize the acceptance of Linda Harriet Lane Fund Grant from Community Foundation Center Georgia for about $1,000. This $1,000 will be used for... Uh, the proceeds going to the Why Clean Streets Matters c contest program for their essays. Uh, our, our director, community director, Dr. Henry Ficklin, uh, asked for these funds to be sent there so he could pay these uh, students who participated in this uh, for their awards for first, second, third place, et cetera. Uh, and they've agreed to fund it for $1,000. So I, I'd entertain a motion to approve this acceptance grant. A motion by Commissioner Bronson. We'll get a second. Second by Commissioner Jones. Uh, any further questions? Hearing no questions, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Item D is a resolution ratifying the acceptance of Georgia Department of Transportation funding, the amount of $2 million, costs associated with the runway extension project in Middle Georgia Regional Airport. Um, can I get a motion to approve the acceptance of these funds? Commissioner Lucas in your district, and I get a second by Commissioner, who was that? Commissioner Wilder over here. Uh, we have a motion and second. These are something that's already done in July of 2020. Uh, we're, we're accepting these funds uh, for the runway extension this time and appropriating that uh, formally. We do have a motion and second. There's no further discussions. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries. It will be sent to consent agenda. Going to move on to item 7A, which is a ordinance. Ordinance to make Bibb County Commission to adopt the Economic and Community Development Department, ESG, Home and CDBG a proposed budget for fiscal year 2023. We have Ms. Jackson here today to give you a presentation uh, on that budget and answer any questions you have, and then we'll uh, entertain a motion after that. Everyone, um, these are funds that are received every year from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation just to explain um, what each one of these funds actually mean. Um, we're going to start off by that first slide, just talking a little bit about um, the funds and the purpose, the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to help develop viable urban communities by providing decent housing, suitable living environments, as well as expanding economic opportunities for low to moderate income individuals. Again, these are funds through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. As we move to the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the three funding sources that we have here today. That's emergency solutions grant funds, that's home funds, as well as community development block grant funds. The first funding source that we'll talk about is emergency solutions grant funds as we move to the next slide. With emergency solutions grant funds, these are funds that are provided to us um, as a part of the HEARTH Act. And these funds are utilized for um, homeless prevention, that's for those individuals that are in the, um, are about to be evicted from a unit, as well as rapid rehousing. Those are individuals that are actually homeless. Uh, as we move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the funding that has been identified for our community, which is $159,534. Of that amount, with that summary, is um, we can do approximately 7.5% toward administrative costs. That'll be a total of $11,000. $965, and then also the remaining that we're recommending for homeless prevention as well as rapid rehousing. That is $147,569 for a total of $159,534 as a part of that particular funding source. Next, we'll talk about our um, home investment partnership funds. Um, with home investment partnership funds, these are funds that can only be used toward providing housing related activities. So this involves anything that deals with new construction, uh, rehabilitation, uh, rental um, projects, as well as um, new um, homeowner, uh, homeowner opportunities for low to moderate income individuals. 
As we move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the breakdown of that particular um, proposed funding source. For the actual entitlement amount, we anticipate on receiving $928,940. Um, for our um, program income, we anticipate on 125000 This is money that we receive back from loans that have been lended over the years. And then also um, approximate home match of $1,666. Um, then we also look at the program administration, approximately 10% of that. That's $105,394. Uh, and then for our developer projects, these are projects that are done by um, different investors, developers that come to us and apply. That's $810,000. $871. Then for CHOTOs, which is actually our community housing development um, organizations, these are organizations that are nonprofits um, in our community that may be doing housing um, for low to moderate income individuals in that area. We're requ required to do 15% um, toward that particular um, initiative, and that's $139,000. $341 for a total of $1,055,606. Next, we'll go to our community development block grant funds. With the community development block grant funds, this particular funding source um, is utilized for um, a lot of our agencies that come forward that are providing different types of services for low to moderate income individuals in our particular community. We'll go ahead and talk a little bit about um, the actual breakdown as far as community development block grant funds um, and the summary for this one. The anticipated amount this year for the entitlement is $1,814,000. $236. And then the revolving loan fund amount, approximately $85,000, and then approximately $17,450 for general fund. Then we um, have for our administration of this project, $397,297. And then for the redevelopment assistance portion, $543,141. For economic development as well as small business, we're looking at um, proposing $90,000. Then for our economic development rehabilitation program, $321,338. And then for our economic development paint program, $60,000. For public facilities as well as infrastructure, that includes any type of demolition that may be required, as well as acquisition, $62,910. For our minor home repair, we do have agencies that apply, um, and we have Rebuilding Macon that applied to us this year, and the recommendation for that advisory board was 133000 and then for their volunteer youth for Rebuilding Macon was 54000 um, We have several um, of public service activities that we'll move to the next slide and talk about those. With those particular activities, um, this year we had received an application for Big Brothers Big Sisters, and the recommendation from that review committee is $20,825. $20, for Crisis Line and Safe House, that recommendation is $35,561. For Family Advancement Ministries, the recommendation is $12,658. For Family Counseling Center of Central Georgia, that recommendation is $23,664. For Home First, the recommendation is $76,044. For Make and Bid Economic Opportunity Council, their dental program, the recommendation is $13,000. For the Make and Bid Economic Opportunity Council Transportation Program, $5,000. Then for the Mentors Project of Bibb County, $10,000, as well as the Salvation Army, $58,248 for a total of $255,000. Um, on our next slide, we've already talked a little bit about the rehabilitation. So um, for that particular one, that total is 187,000. And then we'll go on to any questions. But just as a reminder with regards to these funds, that normally what we do every year is that we understand that the amount of money that we receive versus the amount of programs and the different things that need to be done in our community actually does not compare. Every year we take applications for our community development block grant funds. Those applications are done um, normally at the end of October, beginning of November. 
Uh, we also take applications for our home investment funds as far as developers are concerned. That's normally done at the beginning of the year, about February or April. And then we also do for emergency solutions grant funds. But for emergency solutions grant funds, you must be a member of the Homeless Coalition. That particular application is normally done toward the beginning of the year as well, about January. So just to give you a little bit of information as far as the funding sources that I've talked about today. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Commissioner Tillman? Uh, yes. Uh, normally, I would have talked to you a little bit more about this stuff, Mr. Mayor, but we could not open board docs. And I literally, I was looking at my phone, sent my last message about 1.42 a.m. this morning. So uh, y'all got to forgive me. Uh, I, I normally don't have questions and discussions like this. But uh, one question is about the Chodo. Uh, for those nonprofits, and, and we don't, it's not as much as it normally has been, and we don't have much develop. There's a lot of development going on, but for whatever reason, the Chodo uh, projects, uh, those numbers are seen to be down. So I just have one question. Normally, for those nonprofits, it's up to $15,000 that they got to pay for the application fee. What are we doing about that? Because a lot of those nonprofits can't pay that. Or am I missing something? And, and probably tying it in to, to P and Z, because I was in a recent meeting where, where some of the folks that planned and zoning said they could help with the Chodos and to uh, knock off that 15%. Uh, that sounds like a, no, a low number to most folks, but for a nonprofit, it's up to $15,000. So have we looked at changing those numbers uh, to waive that or get them in with planning and zoning and see if we can reduce those figures? Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with what you're talking um, in reference to. Um, for the community development housing um, organizations, that is an application process by which they must certify the makeup of their board. Um, they also must have that in their charter and the information, the articles of uh, incorporation, that they are an organization that focuses on housing for, um, for low to moderate income individuals and things of that nature. I'm assuming, but I'm not totally sure, that maybe it might have been a project that they may have been working on, but I'm just not familiar with that because well, there is not a, a payment that's required as a part of our particular project for them to apply. So, so on the Chodo project, when you're going to do a Chodo, you have to pay 15%. The 15% number is from who? No, the 15% requirement is actually a requirement that we are expending as a part of um, the funds that we're receiving from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So they can actually receive more than that amount depending upon what the application is and if it is a viable application to move forward. Okay. So the amount, that 15% is what we're actually providing to that organization, not them providing that I to wish us. Dr. Ficklin was here because he was in that meeting with me uh, about a month or so ago when we were discussing the Chodo. Uh, he's not here, uh, but I I'll get with you later and, and just see where we are. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Commissioner Lucas? Um, yes. D a few weeks ago, Commissioner uh, Watkins um, introduced, th there were several uh, initiatives that he presented to us. Um, one of them was the voucher program, wh which would assist making bib uh, parents in providing a portion of the fees for their children in some of these uh, summer programs. I know there are a lot of different things that are out there now, which is great. Uh, the voucher program, though, was a program that for those children who wanted to take part in organized sports or who wanted to, I believe it could be used for uh, paying a, a portion of the fees for uh, the summer program in our rec centers. And um, I mentioned at that time that I thought that since um, your department had undertaken the voucher program previously, that this might be an opportunity for looking at that program again. And um, I, I just, uh, my question is, is there a place anywhere in your budget 
for, and I know the commission has to concur and the mayor have to concur uh, with this, and I don't know whether anybody has a problem with the voucher program or not, but I've, de I've described the way that it works and there's income verification and all of that to make sure that folks fall within the low to moderate income levels, but it would assist and there, are, especially with the summer program where there are a number of children who were not uh, able to pay the entire fee, whose families were not able to pay the entire fee for them to be involved in organized activities that are uh, rec centers. So is there a place that you could see where uh, $15,000 could be found, could be moved over to um, look at a uh, voucher program. And I'm just I'm asking my colleagues and the mayor and you as well. Um, with that particular program, that was actually a program that was applied to us through um, through the recreation department at that particular time. So I would actually need to discuss that um, with the recreation department. And what would happen is, is that if we were able to, um, to find those funds, I can't tell you off the top of my head if we have that in the budget that we currently have right now. But I can come back with that information, but I also need to talk to them because they will be the, um, they're actually the ones that applied previously with regards to that particular program and ran that program as far as other um, organizations that they worked with to provide those vouchers to those organizations. Right, um, I guess I'm trying in this budget to make sure that we make provisions for such a program. Uh, it was a beneficial program. I saw it in operation, and it not only covered uh, part, it was a part because the parents had to pay the largest portion of the whatever the fee would be, but a small portion of it, then if they were eligible, they could pay for it. And it also uh, involved uh, partial uh, payment for other kinds of things, like music classes, art classes, those kinds of organized activities that are already going on in the, in the community. So um, uh, if the attorneys and the mayor could help me with determining how we could, and you could, as the uh, department head, could help me in determining how we could go about setting this aside because I wouldn't like for us to go another year without having this at least you know on the <laughs> on the radar screen because mm -hmm. I think a lot of kids will benefit uh, from it so help uh, Commissioner, I hear you. I think the MVP program and the recent Community Foundation of Central Georgia grants uh, give several hundred thousand dollars to these, to music, to sports, to chess, to many items there. Uh, I think that's one way to look at it, to, to see what they're doing there to make sure we're not duplicating. Uh, I think there's some, some barriers to using the ARP funds for that, so it would certainly be general fund. Uh, I think Mr. Watkins had brought up the, that voucher system. I've had mixed reviews about it from wh whether it's effective before in the, in the past. Uh, is probably better just to uh, add the additional funding to recreation and, and, and then let them do it without having to use a voucher system. But that, that's conversation uh, for another day. Uh, Ms. Mayor, I'm asking how we can get it done. I really don't care how yeah. we do it as long as it's legally <laughs> legal to do it. But I think that program was beneficial. I saw it in operation and a number of folks who don't want stuff free. They don't want you to give them the whole thing. They will apply to get some assistance, a portion of their children's fees uh, uh, paid, and there are income requirements. The program really did work. And some of these others, I don't know the length of them. I don't know whether they're, you know, like a one-time uh, thing. I hope not. But this will be would be in addition to what's already being offered, which is is wonderful. MVP is doing a lot, but there are some families that 
you know, they won't apply. They won't go to these other things. But if you have a program where a small portion of their fees could be taken care of, and it's not just playing ball, it's other kinds of things uh, too. I just wanna, uh, however it's determined that it can be done, I'd like to see us go ahead and commit to an effort to have this done, and that would take care of one of the proposals too. So is there a motion that I need to make, or can we just? I think now, I, I think what I would prefer is to have Commissioner Watkins circulate that resolution to all the commissioners and see if we can build some consensus on that. And then if it needs to be tweaked some for a final to bring back, I hate to remove some With from the table. With a proposal for the funding for it. Is that what? That's fine then. Well, the program itself, I think a lot of the commissioners may not be familiar with the specific facts on how that will be implemented. I think you need to have a good consensus before we okay. take that off the table and vote it down. So, thank you, Commissioner Lucas. Commissioner Watkins. And thank you for continuing the discussion um, on creating the voucher program for our youth. Um, again, I think the MVP program are offering great opportunities and, and great programs are being created there, but there are a lot of pay walls for a lot of opportunities for youth, particularly like this summer, summer camps, um, providing for our low income youth in our city, which 30% of our city is qualifying as low income. To have greater opportunity reduces, ideally, I think we all agree, an engaged youth is someone who's not as likely to commit crimes and end up being part of our juvenile justice system. That's kind of the goal of uh, of such acts and like I say I think I've I'm more than welcome to talk to anybody offline on the issue I would also appreciate us to be able to talk about the issue formally in our commission so we can actually get the work done when we're supposed to do it but I've, I've sent emails kind of detailing the program I can resend them out to everyone I think we also have uh, physical copies of the uh, of the resolution but like I say I'm more than happy to continue the conversation um, as it relates to the CDBG funds though I And the reason, I guess, Commissioner Lucas was asking this was because of the um, the public the public service uh, component of the CDBG funds. And I remember back during when we were first talking about consolidating the government, one of the biggest conversations was if we consolidate, how much more money we would get from federal government and other places to help us solve our problems, mainly from funds like CDBG. And as I look at the the amounts that we're discussing today. Over the years, they've, they, there was no real jump or change. Like, we're still under $2 million when it comes to CDBG funds. Um, like I said, and then I can remember us having tense conversations about, you know, because we would get millions of dollars of requests from very worthy, qualifying public safety or public service organizations and only have a quarter million dollars to work with. Um, frustrating for her department, frustrating for us involved because most of us, particularly those representing low-income sections of the town, can see the need very much and it exceeds greatly what's on this paper. Um, but I support everything that's happening. I, I was curious on the, on the, Chodo, on the Chodo side. Uh, how many Chodo, active Chodos does the community have? Currently, we only have one. And, it, and so for the 15% allotment, that one Chodo is receiving the 100% of it every year, or is still, there a program balance amount there? They're still required to apply. So what happens is, is that every year there is an application process where other agencies can actually apply to, um, to become a CHODO. So used to be that you would be certified and you could apply all year as far as different projects. Now the way that the federal government has it set up is that you must apply to be a CHODO for each individual project that you may be submitting at that particular time. So right now we only have one active that's actively working on a project. Uh, but again, we may have more in the future. It depends upon the application pool that we receive for that particular year. And is there any program balance left over from previous years or is the 139 the full? 
Um, at this time, we're actually looking at that to determine if we will have some additional um, from the previous year as far as the Chodo pool. What happens is, too, is that even though you may be certified and you can be a Chodo, you may apply to be a developer this year. Let's say that there may be something different as far as your board makeup or there may be something different that is not letting you meet those factors that are required to actually be a Chodo. How many... Um with the with the fresh fruit retailer fund that we created um, a couple years ago, I didn't I didn't hear that mentioned in any of these budgets or. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. I started talking and I couldn't hear myself, we couldn't so I knew <laughs> the mic wasn't on. Um, for that particular fund, that's a fund that was set up um, with regards to commission, so that's not something that would be included in this particular um, budget. So that's something that would be totally separate. It, to your knowledge, is that fund still solvent or has all of it been depleted? Um, to my knowledge, but I don't want to say that um, without actually looking at that information that there are still funds there. Okay. Can you talk to me a little bit about the homeless services? It seemed like you said 159000 was the amount for homeless and rapid rehousing. Yes. So How many folks do we assume that that's? services or what's our goal then? Um, actually it depends upon the um, it actually depends upon the number of individuals and what type of services that they're seeking. Uh, sometimes we may be able to serve 30 people. Sometimes it may be only 20, depending upon what those needs are. We have a variety of individuals that actually come, so we would have to look at what that was on that particular basis as far as that particular year. So because what they also do is try to couple that with other sources in our community as well to make the dollars go further. Okay, but 159 covers roughly uh, 30 to 20 people a year? Yes, depending upon what the services are and whether they're able to find other funding sources to couple with the need of that particular client. And I guess when it comes to the housing section, how many like new houses or what's our metrics for success with the, with the fund? Most of it is centered around, I guess, creating new housing? Or um, housing? Actually, we've had um, we've had rehabilitation as well as um, new construction. So we have a, a somewhat of a mix. We have more new construction than we do have um, as far as rehab, but we do have some rehab projects as well as far as units coming back online. Right now, I think the majority of the things that we've done in the last few years have dealt with actual rental type projects. Mr. Watkins, oh. we have uh, Commissioner Jones. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. Ms. Jackson, just a couple of questions briefly, if, if you don't mind. Under public services like Big Brothers, Crisis Line, Salvation Army, what are some of the things that you do to help those type of good organizations? Um, with Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, one of the things that they have, um, we have assisted them with has been um, assistance as far as marketing and some of the other things that they're doing, trying to get mentors back in as far as their particular program is concerned. Um, with Crisis Line and Safe House, there's a variety of things that, um, that we have helped to provide as far as that shelter itself, um, all the way from um, assistance as far as communication, um, also um, assisting as far as um, different types of repairs that may need to be done as far as that particular, it depends upon that particular year in that application. Um, actually, the other ones that we've had as far as Family Advancement Ministries, with Family Advancement Ministries, um, that one, that one does um, booster and car seats um, as far as that particular um, facility is concerned. Then with family counseling services, those are counseling services that are actually being provided for home first. Those are foreclosure counseling services as well as home buyer services that are being provided. Um, then with the dental program, these are services for homeless individuals that lack um, dental insurance. 
And then also with tra um, transportation, that's also providing transportation for those individuals that are homeless as well. For the Mentors Project, that is to provide academic, um, to provide academic based prevention and intervention type services and mentoring. And then for the Salvation Army, that is also to assist with services for adults and children and providing enriched programs, camps, and other types of things as far as um, that particular facility is concerned. Okay, and question number two, what, what exactly do you do to prevent homeless? What are things that you can do to prevent people from being homeless? Uh, one of the things that we do is, is that with the funding that we are receiving as far as the Department of Housing and Urban Development, that um, we do try to provide those with programs that will eventually lead to permanent housing. But we're also a part of the Homeless Coalition. We're also a part of the Balance of State um, as far as the continuum of care as well, wherein although those are funds through the state, but we're also looking at um, what type of assistance can we do and what can we do as far as mentoring with different and um, partnering with other organizations to actually provide the best um, sort resources as far as individuals are concerned. Understanding that one of the things that you do have um, as far as uh, we do have an influx of individuals coming from other locations as well. So, but it, th does it help with people like, let's suppose someone's having trouble paying their mortgage, they're headed to foreclosure, is there any, any programs there that helps with counseling or? That's the Home First program That's that actually first. assists okay. with foreclosure um, counseling. Um, and they've had some success stories in there. I mean, everything is not always a success story as far as helping individuals to be able to have that conversation with their mortgage company right. to determine is there a forbearance or is there another avenue by which to help prevent that foreclosure for that home. Right. And then the, the rebuilding making comes in to be able to help them fix up or repair their homes, people that don't have that money, they don't have those dollars. Correct, yes, so that they can stay in their homes longer. Okay, thanks so much. Mr. Lucas. Thank you. Um, do you have your um, uh, sheet that has the information on other sources of funding for uh, look at rebuilding uh, Macon? I know we used to get a, a sheet that had the um, other sources of funding, the other amounts of money that, because none of these organizations depend totally on community development funds to operate. They have other operating uh, uh, sources. So do you have the total what's that total the budget? total amount that they actually receive in other funding sources in in-kind sources they receive approximately three hundred and sixty thousand in in-kind that is for the minor home repair program um, and that one and they also receive one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars um, in match as far as that particular program then up under the volunteer youth program they receive approximately sixty thousand dollars in match and then they have approximately $75,000 that they have in in-kind services. Okay, so what's their total budget? I wasn't adding that quickly. I'm sorry. As you were going through. Do all of these organizations have, they all have to provide to you their total budgets, don't they? Their other sources of income. Um, for the different programs that they are requesting for us, yes, we do ask for what are the other sources that you will be receiving. And if they are um, grants that you're applying for, that we ask that you say that, hey, these are grants that we're applying for that we anticipate, but we have not received yet. Uh, okay, what was their total budget? Hold on just a minute. Maybe I ought to ask it this way. What percentage of their total budget comes from community development? Because this program was never intended to fund, totally fund, or to fund in substantial uh, numbers the budgets of organizations. It was to provide for certain, f to allow them to provide certain services that helped with low and moderate income folks. So it would be less than 50% of their budget. 
Pardon? Less than 50% of their budget based upon the other? I, I, yeah, I would hope so. What is the, that's a large percentage of a budget. Uh, I, I don't know, but, and I've been through a lot of these budgets, but I've never seen one where we continue to fund uh, an organization, an organization at that high a level. But um, I always felt better when I saw the public, um, what's that last category where you have all those organizations that are funded? The, the last what was the percentage? You said under 50 percent? Yes, okay, that we're actually doing as far range. as their budget. Um, we, when you take into consideration, so I'm trying to do the math in my head, I'm so sorry. Just divide the total budget into the uh, amount that we. this amount is right but um, it looks like it is about 39 percent if I'm not mistaken okay is that about the amount for the other entities um, it depends the, upon what they in actually, that same what, category I'm not talking about Chodos or any of the others I'm talking about this particular it depends upon so, the amount that was actually requested as far as those organizations are concerned okay what did they request so here it has the amount that was requested. Um, for example, um, and Big Brothers Big Sister, the amount that was requested was forty-two thousand. I mean, forty-four thousand two hundred twenty-nine dollars. They received twenty thousand eight twenty-five. But understanding some of the things that they may have been requesting may have also been things that may not have been eligible up under these funds and everything else. Okay, so, so there's a good rationale for. Yes. Uh, us approving 39% of one organization's budget. Yes. I think that's too high. I think other organizations could benefit. The voucher program, for instance, could be funded through that and a number of other programs where the people got to apply. I They've got to apply and go through your training session and all of that I, I understand but I just want to point out that there are some areas some places that's possibly could um, you know be cut so that other things like the voucher and some other programs if these people apply could be could be funded uh, I think um, do you know how much the restore store makes the rebuilding has a re, don't they have a restore store? Um, and they receive donations. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just showing you that there is some room in here I think for us. I think there's a separate entity, Ms. Lucas. They are a part of, they receive the funds from the sale of donated building materials is that what i know that habitat for humanity is the one that actually has yes. the restore well what does uh rebuilding have i'm not sure that they have a store i would have to check with them with regards to that because i'm not uh, familiar uh, with it okay that, all I'm right I've, I, I don't want to belabor this i know you have other 
things and you're already twitching over there. <laughs> <laughs> I had to order see, lunch now. I, I see it. <laughs> but uh, I just, um, did I turn my, I wish we had just a little more time to kind of look through this a little bit more. However, it doesn't look like we have, but I hope that the questions that I've asked will start the conversation maybe for the next time around. And Ms. Mayor, I would strongly recommend that we look at this over a, if, when we get to the next uh, time that we are to approve this budget, that we have a little more time to look at it and then have a separate uh, session because this is a separate budget um, that offers us an opportunity to do some different things. And I also want to explore, I know something the mayor has come up with and that is uh, having developers to look at put, putting um, homes on the vacant properties because we, we're uh, demolishing a lot of them, but we need to put something back. That's great. But uh, over in Warner Robins, their community development department went into the business of acquiring a lot of properties, and they uh, got people specifically to redevelop some properties and also to put new structures over there. I think we could do that. Uh, as well. I really wish that we could do that. That would supplement what you're doing and would add to our housing stock because we really do have a housing crunch in this community. I'm going to end uh, uh, there before you Thank you, Commissioner. Mute we're, we're getting in the weeds here. But thank you for letting me ask you those thank questions. Thank you. And I would also like to say that with regards to rebuilding Macon, that we do put a large amount over there because we are trying to assist as far as any way we can as far as keeping homeowners in their homes. And they do provide minor home repair as well as other agencies. So um, they get that particular um, source also does have um, a high priority just like our public service. Unfortunately, we do receive the highest number of applications on the public service side, and that is the lowest amount that we can actually give out. Thank you. I, I think also Warner Robins gets a chip, and Biff County is not eligible for it. That's why they're able to do that. But I, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds. Mr. Wickers, you got something to add to this conversation? I'm sorry, Commissioner Watkins, you got something to add to this conversation? Yes. Um, I was curious before. I got two questions, but the, um, the total amount, that was applied for when it comes to that public safety section. I know we, we, we're, we're distributing, it seems like 233,000, but I was curious on the total. Not just from the applicants that received funds, but just in total, even if we deny The total them. amount that was applied for is over a million dollars. As far as in requests that we receive, we receive over a million dollars in requests. And y'all end up dwindling that down to 230,000. 250, I'm sorry, 250,000, and then the 187, yes. So if if we as a body thought that all of the million dollars, and I don't know if they are or not, were qualified, eligible, and not a duplication of service, where would the extra 750 come from if that's what we wanted to do? Um, to the regulations um, for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. There is, if it's public service related, there is only 15% of the total allocation that we can do toward that. So we will have to review that, but that's also taken into consideration if we received any program income or anything um, over the years. But we also have to reduce that amount if we don't get what we anticipate. There, there's no second place to apply to from the federal government to I don't know, request more funds or request the amendment based upon need, the funds or the funds you have to work within it, if I'm understanding you right? Not for public service, no, sir. Not for public service, but I guess for other sections of the no. CDBG? No, no, okay. there's not an additional fund. What happens is every year that there is, um, if you're an entitlement, it's based upon the number of individuals that you have in your community as well as the poverty rate and then it also takes into consideration the number of communities that are entering the pool as well as the number of entities that may be exiting the pool okay so 
and I, and I appreciate the efforts and the conversation. My goal wouldn't be, I think most of these programs are worthy and doing good work and in all the spaces that we could be doing more. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd hate to affect it in a way that we're depleting some fund and it results in, I guess, fewer houses getting built or some type of consequence like that. I, I wish we could have a conversation about vouchers and our youth um, on if we need to add more funds, can it come from fund balance or if you have program income versus a conversation on, you know, discrediting one of, one of these folks. And again, I don't think that was commissioner's attempt at, uh, attempt at all. Um, but I, I, would, I would love to approach it from, from that type of angle. And I, I guess it would just help me out a little bit, just for a little bit more clarity before we close this conversation out. Like when you say there are mixed reviews on the concept of vouchers, is that from the perspective of people who were applying and receiving the program had access issues and then like the application process? Or is it like uh, folks don't like the idea of poor folks getting extra government service? I think the effectiveness of the program and the way it was implemented is, is, is the, what I've heard. I, I'm not going to have a discussion on that personally right now. I'm just telling you I had mixed reviews on it, um, so I wanted to know more information about it. Just like I had mixed reviews on Midnight Basketball, but we're having that now. So you, you have to investigate some things for yourself when you get mixed reviews sometimes. So I, I'm doing the same on this particular situation. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Tillman, we're going to close out with uh, you, okay? Yes. Uh, been seeing you for years, been doing this for years. This always comes up conversation, how do we get other folks on, on board? We constantly see the same number of folks getting funding and we always try to come up with ways to get other folks funding that we feel sometimes is in need. Uh, I know a lot of y'all keep up with commission meetings and the inquiry, things that we inquire about. Um, I appreciate it because by this time, Dr. Moffitt will have stood up and rescued you from us by now, uh, but he, he hadn't done that today. We appreciate that. But uh, thank you for what you do. Be blessed. Thank you. Okay, well, we do have a, um, take a vote on this. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed budget by Ms. Jackson. Can we get a second? Got a second by Commissioner Jones. Any further discussion? Hear no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Uh, commissioners, the time is now 11 o'clock. We're going to take a comfort break till 1110. Uh, we do have several uh, items that require a lot of attention to that we'll, we'll have this, as well as a uh, lengthy executive sessions and a roads work program today. So we will also have lunch, so it will probably be a working lunch. So at this time, we'll take a 10-minute comfort break. We'll see you back at 1110.
All righty, we're back on. Shark me the whole meeting. We're at item 7B. Item 7B is an ordinance of the Macon Bibb County Commission to amend Article 3 of Chapter 17 of the Macon Bibb County Code of Ordinances to grant the Director of Authority to promulgate rules related to safety, to amend the penalty for violations, to add additional rules related to unsupervised minors at Tobisofki Recreation Area. Uh, as most of you know, we've had a couple of instances at the uh, Tobisofki and other areas here. And uh, one in particular, our, our uh, director of Toby Sofke asked us to draft up something, give him a little bit more authority on how to control things there, in particular in this situation here, unsupervised minors. So I'll have our attorney um, go over the information here and then we'll entertain motions at the appropriate time. I just wanted to note there's only like three big changes to this section on Tobisofki. Uh This section purports to be all the rules related to Tobisofki, and it occurred to the director that he didn't have power to make new rules when instances are happening like fast. He would have to come before commission and a new rule would have to be added to this list of, um, I believe now it's at 53 rules and commission would approve it, it would go to another week of commission. And so uh, he asked for more authority to issue rules um, related to specifically to safety, not related to the fees being charged or anything like that, just to safety of visitors at the site. And so um, he, we've come up with the proposed changes to chapter 17 of the code. The first one is in 1751. Um, and it gives the director that authority from time to time to issue rules related to the safety of visitors at the recreation area. And those rules will have the same effect as the rules specifically enumerated um, in this code section. The second change adds for additional uh, punishment for offenses. Before the only punishment authorized by the code was a fine, a um, sentence to work for public works not exceeding 60 days or a sentence of imprisonment not to exceed 50 days, all to be determined by the judge. Um, lesser, the changes we've requested or we've had requested were lesser penalties, like a verbal reprimand or immediate removal from the park. So before, if someone was violating, technically you could only give them a ticket, and if they continue to violating, you could give them another ticket. But this gives him the power to kick people out immediately. And then um, finally, the last change is in. 1760 and all it does is add number four which says that all children under 14 years of age must be supervised by an adult while in or upon any body of water within the recreation area so it just means that um, anybody below high school age needs to have someone an adult supervising them not accompanied by that means like you can come in with with an adult but that adult needs to be providing supervision while they're on the water as well it's not just that they're in the park with them and those are the proposed changes. Commissioner Tillman. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, guys, I'm, I'm telling you, literally, I was up to at least two something this morning when board docs finally came back up. And it's not a, a, a slight on anybody, but sometimes I get accused of not paying attention and, and reading some of our material. Um, 17.51 is is really vague when we're talking about punishing most of this stuff is about youth uh but youth are not uh necessarily driving boats and causing a lot of issues uh i don't know if i if a, a pr person can you pull up that photo for for me i want to share with everybody that photo of uh, uh of this guy here uh a, a year ago will Childs. Uh, and this is not Will Childs, this is Larry Rainey Jr. Uh, a year ago, Will Childs lost his life at Lake Tobisaki. Uh And we need to implement not only changes there, but uh, Larry Rainey Jr., who y'all see, recently lost his life at our Amoson uh, River Park. And uh, he is a, a father, and go back to that, that other picture. He worked at Pepsi-Cola, he loved the fish, but that's his wife who uh, is confined to a wheelchair. He pushed her around every day. 
he died a couple of weeks ago at, 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 at Amazon River Park, leaving a wife and, and, and a baby. So the changes, I don't know if Mr. Mayor, if you'd be willing to, uh, uh, I did want to speak on this, but we need to implement more changes. At our lakes and, and, and parks, we, we don't have size limits on boats. That needs to be a part of this. Uh, speed limit enforcement needs to be a part of this. Uh, boat safety courses for those people operating boats need to be a part of this. The weekend presence at Lake Tobasaki and Amundsen River Park needs to be uh, increased. We have funds available for all of that. Skiers, tubers are not required to wear life vests. Those things need to be improved. Uh, there's no insurance requirements. If we get pulled over by law enforcement today, we're required to have proof of insurance, and now it's in the state system. There's no uh, requirements for insurance on boating. Uh, the 911 uh, dispatcher, I think, immediately needs to call the uh, DNR uh, personnel to update them when situations like this happens. And we need possibly rangers on call. People cannot and do not see uh, rangers on call. You can see them if you're going to fish and if you don't have your fishing license. But these parks, and, and especially during the summer months, are very, very important. And I just think 17.5 uh, is very vague when we're talking about punishing adults for uh, not supervising children. Uh, and, and I understand what we're trying to do, but um, I just think if we can table this to implement those things, because I don't have some of these in writing that I want to see happen, and I think all of us want to see it happen. But when you see uh, Larry Rainey, who could swim, but jumped into our uh, Amundsen uh, uh, River Park and didn't realize how deep it was because of signage or whatever, it's something that we need to do to warn folks. And I know that we have other folks that have recently uh, passed away as well. But I think uh, when it comes to water, and, and God knows uh, every summer is just a number of, of children and young folks that we're going to lose to water. Water is a babysitter, whether people believe it or not. You take your child to the water park, the beach, put them in a pool, and you can do whatever for the next two, three hours. They never want to get out. They love water. So uh, to avoid issues on making bills behalf, I just think uh, the families of Will, Will Childs, uh, who was in a boating accident uh, last year, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, Larry Rain Jr., I just think we just need to implement more uh, safety precautions. And I would appreciate if we could uh, either add that later or if we want to table this to, to, to really put some true teeth behind this because it's not children that, uh, that, that, that are mostly lo losing their lives on the age of 14. It's, it's adults. Thank you, and I yield. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Tillman. Just let me say one thing. I, I prefer to go ahead and vote this uh, in if possible we can always amend that and change it I will like to make sure that uh, I think every commissioner here including myself as mayor received the uh, I guess the email list you were, re you were reading off of they specifically asked for each and every one of those items line item by right. line item from Jeannie Childs and I want to make sure that all those um, requests there some we can do some of them we, we legally prohibited from doing but certainly I think our attorneys uh, will look at that this ordinance here was drafted up and these changes were drafted up before we had the incident this last week. It was not necessarily a boating incident. It was related to uh, not having a life jacket on at the time of tubing. Uh, certainly there are some things we can do and some things we are, we're not or we're prohibited from doing. But Is Oatmoge Field still out there at Amerson? But, but my preference is uh, will be to um, my preference would be to go ahead and consider this right here and, and pass this and come back with specific amendments that we're allowed to do by law. Um, so the um, that that would be the preference, but I, I do. Is I, it anything that I've listed so far that we that you would not agree on, or, or the body? I don't know agree? that I, I I don't I'm not saying I would disagree with anything on okay. here, but I think okay. we are limited by by state law on what we can do. Uh, I know our attorneys and, and also our director there and DNR have been having conversations about this as well as um, people we have coming down Amerson Park. We have people who drop in at Juliet, which is out beyond our control. Uh, that happened to flow through Macon Bibb County. So certainly it's something I think all commissioners are concerned about the safety of our constituents. Uh, and certainly we want people to exercise due care 
uh, on not drinking and driving on a bus uh, and go in excessive speed. And also we want people to exercise a reasonable care for their own safety by putting on um, their safety vest. But yeah. I think- and I love to be a co-sponsor of yeah, this as well. This is something that we'd like to go ahead and do today, if you don't mind, and we can revisit this with specific information. I, and what I would suggest, if we have uh, new um, decisions that we wanna make on this, that we get those to our attorneys and make sure we're legally able to do that. I know I've had a few people reach out from Toby Sopkin and other areas about wanting to get, um, and I, I think y'all have had these before, uh, particularly about the size of boats there uh, that people have for recreation on, on the lake. So I, I certainly think it's worthy of a further conversation, but I don't want to hold that up to prevent giving him the authority to possibly save somebody's life before we can have that done. And just finally, if I could say this, we all get a lot of emails and calls. We don't always respond and be responsive. And uh, so this one here, because more recently, uh, what happened to Larry Rainey uh, really uh, touched my heart. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Now, Commissioner Watkins, you have something to answer? I guess, yeah, I, I share all of uh, Commissioner Tillman's uh, sentiments. I would like to see changes concerning boating as it relates to Tobasaki added to our um, recreation area rules and policies. Um, particularly, I'd like to see it before I vote, because I know a lot of times we vote on stuff, and then even though we think something's coming back, it never comes back um, after we vote, because it's been voted on. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to delaying to get these changes on boating in here. It, and so current today, like the red spots in here, it seemed like, could you tell me the changes, the elevator version of what I'd be approving if I voted for this unamended? Absolutely. Um, just the highlights. One, we're giving the director power to institute any rule related to safety of visitors at the park. That includes boating. Um, any rule related to safety of visitors at the park, it gives him the power concurrent with your power to do that. That's in section 1751. 1752 adds uh, a couple more punishments besides just a ticket. It adds him the authority to be able to give a verbal reprimand when he sees or, or his designees a verbal reprimand or two, uh, the ability to remove somebody for non-compliance from the recreation area. And then he can also issue any of those tickets, the same penalties that were allowed before. The last change was a specifically enumerated change added to that list of rules that was already there. And it, it is, it's just a rule about minors. And it says you have to be super, you have to, uh, if you're 14 or under, you have to be supervised on any body of water in the park. And so those are three separate things. Uh, the director would get the power to promulgate rules related to safety of visitors absent the change to uh regarding supervising minors okay and so understanding uh, previously if you got into some type of altercation at the tobasaki you didn't have to leave you could just stay until you were ready to go according to our code yes i don't know how that that was playing out in enforcement but according to our code yes okay I don't think I'm, I'm not on, on base. I'm not opposed to any of any of these rule changes. Um, more important, I think the boating is the thing that's, as far as I know, and hear complaints about and make the paper, people drowning in the lake and those type of things. Now, I guess I'm not hearing where these rule changes are addressing the thing that I'm most concerned about. I'm understanding, I guess, that I can, I can visualize that children running around during the summer can cause incident. Could you talk to me a little bit more about the I have the ability to make any rule on the spot thing? Because that seems like a very broad power. It, it is not on the spot. He will have to publish it with our clerk of commission, and he'll have to publish it with um, in his office. But it says that he or she may, from time to time, promulgate rules and regulations related to the safety of visitors at the Toposofki Rec Recreation Area, and those rules and regulations will have the same effect as those 53 that are already listed in this code section. So that would be, so <coughs> it is, right now in the park, it, says, it doesn't explicitly say no running in the parking lot or, or something. He could look at that and find out that people are doing that. and ready. Right. Okay. And so he, it allows him the power to address problems immediately without having to wait two commission cycles. So for instance, boating, sa boating safety rules, he can, co he can contact DNR, find out the regulations on what he can, 
what he can regulate and what he can't regulate and issue a rule within two or three days versus bringing it to commission and it taking two months. Okay, I, I heard mentioned that possibly you guys were working on voting rules. Are those, where are we in the process of? Yeah, we're not working on voting rules. We're asking our attorneys to work with the state and DNR to see what we're allowed to do and what we cannot restrict and how we're gonna enforce that. We're in the initial stages of that. Okay. Anything else, Commissioner Watkins? I'll yield. I, I, so initial, just I guess, turnaround time on, I, I guess, a change or amendment to, like I say, to limit bolt sizes or, or speeds. Like, I guess, talk to me a little bit about what that process looks like. I'm more interested in that than what's discussed today. It depends on what is preempted by state law and what's not. And so we just have to do some investigation into what state law says we can and cannot regulate. My expectation it would be on the first Tuesday meeting that we have in August. First Tuesday in August? Yes, sir. Thank you. Are you? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Watkins. Uh, Commissioner Lucas? Um, yeah, I have a, a concern about just the initial line here to grant the director the authority to promulgate rules related to safety. And, and then it goes on to talk about some other things as far as um, penalties for violations and other kinds of things. Um, um, I think that the rules that are in place, we need to review. I think this commission does not need to abdicate its authority to approve um, you know, we don't have many instances where we uh, look at items and say, okay, this makes sense. We're elected to do that. And I just don't feel comfortable saying to a department head that you can put in place any rules and regulations that you want, basically. That's, that's basically what this is saying. And I know there's a list, but what bothers me is the ability to, on the spot, come up with something without the oversight. Now, I'm sure, well, maybe I need to ask, before a rule is put in place, would the attorney's advice be requested? You, you can't just say, do what you want to do in this department and not have somebody that you r report to or ask whether this is going to bring about some lawsuits, whether this makes the problem worse. Um, you've got the county manager, you got the mayor, you got the legal department. You cannot just say, do what you want to do, and then we not have any approval. The initial, Mr. So, Lucas, the initial remark would be that uh, if he had a proposed rule, he would contact his boss, which is a county attorney, who would, I'm sorry, a uh, county manager who would in turn seek legal advice for the county attorneys to see if it's something that we should, should consider doing and whether or not we're legally allowed to do such to avoid having to wait two to three weeks to get on the commission calendar to do that. Uh, if it's something that created such an issue that we believe there was issues with it, it's something we wouldn't uh, approve at that level before it even got to your level. So we certainly have a checks and balances there. This is not someone making their own rules as they go along. They'll have a, a concerted effort with our administration as well. That, that makes so much more um, sense. And I, too, have not had a chance. Maybe all of that's in here. I have not had a chance to read thoroughly through that. But uh, if, it's, if that is not in here, then it needs to be uh, in here. And I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be somewhere else and not in the law itself that process it, it'd be a matter of administration like we generally do but i don't i don't oppose a friendly okay. amendment adding that if you want to add that if you this. don't put it down here it's not going to happen no. I'm, I'm telling you if you don't have it down here it is not going to happen. This is not the only item that somebody would have to consider. These folks that 
this department head would need to go to. This is not the only thing they're handling. And so this kind of stuff will fall through the cracks and I can foresee some bad outcomes on that if that process is not um, in writing somewhere. So yeah, I think where that, will it that be? particular language, I, I'd be open to a friendly amendment on that. We haven't, we haven't even had a motion second yet, but I think we could add that just to make sure we've got some safeguards there. What I don't want to do is just kick this can down the road ourselves while we have some issues. But, that but I do there. think there are some other things that have been brought up that could be um, included here and we could all have input into it. And I think tabling would give us that opportunity to do that. That's not turning this down. That's simply saying that we want to have a little more time for a little more in, input. And I would certainly think that the commissioner representing that area would want to have a little bit more input as we all would since we all have constituents that uh, utilize that. And I don't understand why we can't uh, table it to um, review it one more time. Um, Cause it, I mean, it's not. I think it'll be that August time that we'd have to, to review. But I, I think if this is a small step that we could do if we've, we've got the rest of the summer to go before kids go back to school. I think it's more of an urgent need right now to do something uh, to try to prevent an incident like this from happening again. You can come back and change the entire ordinance when we come back in August. You it won't happen. What's that? I'm telling you, it won't happen. We will not revisit this. We've already said it's going to be on If August you go day. ahead and put stuff in place, what things have we put in place that we have revisited? Everything. Think long and hard. Everything that's been approved by this board has been what, revisited. What items have we approved that we've gone back to? And we said we were going to do it on a number of things. We have not done that. So that makes my point that there is not an urgency on everything. Y'all be willing to, to, to work um, with everybody who has concerns. We just want to ram it on through and be done with it. And we, we're making mistakes that, that we, we've seen in the past, we've done by just approving stuff. So at this time, I'd like to move and respectfully ask that we table this so that we can have input uh, in those items that people have had concerns about. We have a motion to table by Commissioner Lucas. Do we have a second? Who's that? Somebody have a second? Second, um, Commissioner Watkins, uh, undebatable motion. All those in favor of tabling this motion um, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote. We'll start with Commissioner Bronson. How do you vote, sir? Vote yes to table it. Commissioner Lucas? Yes. Mr. Uh, Jones? No. Commissioner Cart? No. Commissioner Wilder? What was that vote, sir? I'm sorry. No. Commissioner Howell? No. Mr. Watkins? Yes. Mr. Tillman? Yes. What was that vote? Four to four. Four to four. So it fails. We have a tie vote? Yes. Oh, I, I vote no to table it. So our item is not tabled. We do, uh, we're back to the original item. I think Mayor Protein Clark has something. Yeah, I just, I, I think that this is because we're in the summer and this has been requested in the jurisdictional um, gray areas of Vertobo have been have been um, uh, explored by the legal department. I, I, I think I'll, I'll push my button when, when Commissioner Tillman was talking because um, I agreed with everything that you were saying. Um, I think that when, and generally I have, I spend a lot of time on the river. My day job is a, is a conservationist along the Old Mulgee Corridor and, and I've spent a lot of time looking at different uh, jurisdictional rights in a previous job as a riverkeeper uh, at the riverkeeper organization over the Okmulgee as well. The, um, the, the jurisdictional concerns that the legal department have are complicated and the state preemption complications are real. Um, we can't, uh, this, this, as I understand it, this section would apply to, to, to Lake Tobasaki and only Lake Tobasaki and we don't have 
the jurisdictional authority, and we don't understand yet. Um, I'm really, 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 I was going to ask that you guys look into it. I was really glad to hear that y'all are working with the state agencies to understand what preemption um, we're facing. But, um, but I don't think we can apply these, these rules generally from Tobasovsky to, to the river at, you know, specifically with, um, with where you can be, what, you know, like, I mean, like, it's, it's as complicated as if you're floating on the river of the Old Mulgee, you're on public land. And the second that you put your feet down, if you um, drop your soda pop in your float and you put your feet down to, to grab your bearings, you are on whosoever land you're on at that moment. It's very complicated. Um, and I think I am in deep, I, I think the, um, you know, we, we're, we've discussed the, the, lives, the lives lost on, on Tobisovsky and Commissioner Tillman brought up Amerson. Um, I'm deeply concerned about the safety in Amerson Water Park. I think that that park is misused. I think that it is under patrolled. Um, I'm concerned that the ranger is not post certified there. Um, I'm concerned that I believe a person died a week and a half ago on a rope swing. Uh, that was either on county or private property across the street from um, uh, that's 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 the state of the state of um, of public safety in Amerson Water Park because of, in my opinion, the uh, overindulgence of alcohol is something that is leading. To, it, is, it is it is it is showing glaring problems in our ability to patrol that area because of the, jurisdi the jurisdictional problems as well. Um, I think that I, I'm sure that the problems that we're seeing in Tobisaki are also alcohol related. Um, and and I, I just what I don't think is if we have a director that's saying that there are rules on the books that they need, they need a, a code change to enforce while summer's going on, I think that's a good thing. I also very much would like this board to, you know, in the same vein, in the same sentiment of, of, of my colleagues that have voiced it to come back. I think we have very deep water related problems that jurisdictional makes enforcing even more complicated and I think that in the August meeting um, I'm most certainly committed to if we can get it together with based on y'all's research um, bringing forward an ordinance and legislation to curb the um, the harm that folks are going through and at, at the, you know in this in this in this gray area but I don't think I agree with the mayor that I don't think we should hold up a proposal that is good and getting towards that end, but not towards the end goal of full, um, of, of, of fully rewriting the code section to make it safer here. Um, and I, and I do just, I do, um, would like to voice caution in, um, the over application of, of, of jurisdictions that like the Old Mulgee River, we cannot regulate traffic on the Old Mulgee River in the same way as we can. The, the Lake Tobasoft is just too different. It's two completely different sets of laws, but there are, um, we can come up with ways to regulate that given if we give the county attorney's office enough time to understand those jurisdictional nuances. So I just want to say I appreciate that and wanted to, I was going to request earlier that we we split these things up because it is too jurisdictional and we, we kind of got there, but I wanted to also avoid, you know, state why I think we should move forward today and what we need to be doing. Not uh, to Commissioner Lucas's point, it need, this needs to be revisited. We've, we've lost lives this summer, so thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Commissioner Jones? Yes, sir. I'm going to concur with the mayor. I think we need to vote this in today. Do I think it's enough? No. I, I agree with all the points that have been made by, by several of you, and I will help this board revisit this. We do need to revisit this, and I'm concerned about alcohol. I'm concerned about speed on the, on the waters as I am on the streets, but I know it's a different animal, and I, I, I do not think we have enough. We, we should have a full-time person as a ranger who's qualified supervising all of these areas so I'm fully committed to revisiting it and enhancing and amending what we would pass here today but I concur and let's let's pass this today and then and let's revisit it Thank I'll you help Mr. you do that Mr. Jones Mr. Wilder and then Commissioner Watkins next uh, yes well to start with on what we're actually looking at today I feel it's important that we do handle this I talked with the director myself yesterday. I've been involved 
pretty heavy out there. It is my district. Uh, what he's run into as much as anything is uh, people check in to get over and get in a pavilion. They get grilling. They don't keep up with their children. And that's kind of what's happening. Just give him some power to be able to, and I don't think he will overstep his boundaries, but I just, I feel like he does need to be able to make some calls on some things that may be one of type things. And I, so I'm confident in that part. Now I did the, evidently the email that all of you have received, I received that also. I haven't talked to that person yesterday, but that person did message me about coming today. And I said, today wasn't a day where they could talk. And I let them know that it would be next Tuesday. So I did encourage them if they wanted to maybe at least get there. The only thing they asked me about then was possibly an on-call patrol person to where if there was an emergency to be able to get a boat on the water. And, uh, but when they sent the email, there was a lot of other things. These are, these are very important things we need to visit. A lot of them are covered by DNR rules, and we got to make sure what's going on there. As most of you know, I spend just every other weekend on the water somewhere, Sinclair, Tobo, somewhere. But we do need to make sure that our attorneys, I agree, make sure our attorneys look into what our legal rights are. And this may even get into a situation with some of the things we look at. We may even need to consider a town hall meeting because it would directly affect property owners that live on Tobo and things of that nature. But they are definitely all very important concerns and things that we do need to address and, uh, and handle them correctly. But the, the small part that we are with him being able to handle this part, I feel like we do need to handle it today. Thank you, Commissioner Wilder. Commissioner Watkins. So since, so since just sitting here and listening to the conversation, my, my opinion has changed slightly over the past few minutes. So <clears throat> the, the under 14, all people should be supervised under 14. That rule makes sense to me, totally get it. Don't wanna see it change, makes sense. The ability to remove folks when they're acting up or provide a verbal reprimand, again, totally for, seems like a solid thing to be able to do as a director, get both of those. The concept of I can make any rule, I understand that y'all are working on a friendly amendment, but I guess at this point, just in listening to the conversation, in order to make a rule, it seems to be a very technical thing that has to do with jurisdictions and preemptions. I don't know if we want to just give that to an authority to make a rule that we don't know about that later gets us in trouble because they didn't contact the attorney's office. So I would like to move to strike that first, those first two sentences in that section leaving the other two verbal reprimand removals and under 14 intact with removing the last sentence, last two sentences of what is that, section 1701? Thus doing away with do I have the ability to make any rule that I want at any time provision. That's my motion, hope I have a second. I'm confused about the motion. Okay, um, so I wanna- Do you have it pulled up? 17, section 1751, the director, so okay. Section. So I want to strike he or she may from time to time promulgate rules and regulations related to the safety of visitors at the Tobasaki Recreation Area and such rules and regulations shall have the same force and effect as those specifically enumerated in the article. So I want to strike that. It seems like we're giving one person too much power in a space that is admittedly vague and difficult to operate due to jurisdictions and preemptions. We don't even know about it as lawyers and policy makers, so why are we gonna just give that power to the director with no oversight? I have a problem with that and I want it to Commissioner, can, so, yeah. can, I, can I ask one question? That, yes. And that's certainly in an order uh, proposal or an order uh, proposed amendment. But picking up on what Com Commissioner Lucas said earlier, is your, do you want to uh, have a procedure whereby is now I don't want to change the procedure as it relates to that at all whatever the procedure is now if that's coming before the Commission which I guess it is leave it intact but that's what I'm saying it, do you want to have a procedure where the director proposes rules subject to the approval of the county manager and county attorney no I want it subject to the County Commission and the mayor as it is now okay then then you this the motion to strike is in order then. correct correct we have a motion. You got a second? 
Mr. Lewis just like to make a second. Um, just one second. And, and it may be helpful to me or anybody that may be voting on the fence. What are some issue areas that the director has has suggested or proposed that he would if he had the authority or autonomy to make changes in? be uh, a question for the county manager okay the county manager uh, I, I'm not I'm not aware of any specifics on that but I can think of a lot of instances where maybe he would have to make a, a call um, sir you, you have a motion a second I, I don't want to I don't want to be like this if you got some consensus but I, I think uh, like I said I was asking a question I might end up voting no to my own motion if somebody <laughs> answers a question that makes sense like I, I just I'm curious I don't know if it's lightning out there maybe it says everybody has to get out of the water I'm not sure if that's in there but I mean certainly you want to give him the authority to tell people they have to get out of the water they're required to because it's lightning in the area and he makes everybody get out of the area um, that's not on the books I wouldn't mind adding that today I, I don't know that it's on the books but it's one of those things that's not what mentioned but it would specifically will allow him to do or you have a situation where someone has allegedly drowned out there and you want to stop all the boats from being able to dock out there because you're trying to search and rescue someone and you say, I want to do that. And it would give him the authority to do things like that. So without micromanaging the whole situation, I think we can build a consensus here to see what we can do. This is something we're going to revisit in August. We have the support. Everybody has already promulgated that now. We're just trying to prevent any potential incidences that we can prevent before August the 4th. So, uh, I mean, you've got a motion, you've got a second. Uh, if you still want to strike that, we'll see where the votes go and we'll move accordingly. Uh, Commissioner Tillman, you got something? Yeah, as a, uh, and I said I want to co-sponsor this. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the uh, sponsor. Uh, and, and I was trying to get some questions answered. I think you answered a little bit of it as to what was the rush on this and can we get it right? And I thought the table was in order and just listening, it's a it's a work in progress, and I think you hear all the concerns of everybody. So that's why I think can we reconsider uh, tabling it uh, for everybody to have input? And I think you kind of answered it. If you go back, like what was the the rush on it? I know life is at, at stake. And the other question I had was in, in answering the question, why are we rushing it? When would it go into effect? The the this stuff. Well, th this will go into effect next Monday, Tuesday night, if you vote on it again. Uh, so, okay. any any other questions regarding uh, the motion by Commissioner Watkins? I had Bronson? a well, not necessarily a question, just a statement in a sense, right? So, uh, I'm I'm listening to the concerns around the horseshoe, uh, and with all the concerns that we have, I'm I'm not. I'm confused as far as why we would want to, you know, why we don't want to table it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a true fan, and if needing to wait to gain a better understanding in regards to jurisdiction, in regards to who has legal rights over what, if something was to happen, right, how do we avoid a mishap um, of it coming back to bite us later on? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, getting a, a clear understanding of the DNR, right? The rules of the DNR. Everyone doesn't understand that piece. So if we're, if, if you hear voices around the horseshoe that clearly, even in Mayor Pro Tem's defense, I get it. Uh, but even in, even in that concern, right? It's you, I can hear the frustration in your voice. I can hear the concern in everyone's voice. Why don't we just table this until next week? I know the vote has already taken place, but even with the proposal that Commissioner Watkins is, is offering up now, I would strongly uh, move to, to strike that last piece down until we get a better understanding of that. We don't want to have another death happen. And then it becomes a question of, well, why didn't we do anything? But the same token piece, we have to know, right, the left and right boundaries that we have. So I, I, I support it. Mayor Burton Clark. Yeah, I, I think I, I, my points earlier bear a little clarification. I believe that they have, I believe that if we are looking at this subsection or this code section, that the county attorney's offices are sure about the jurisdictional nuances that have to do specifically with Tobasovsky. I did not mean to if I, I didn't intend, I, what I intended to say is that the jurisdictional on waterways generally is complicated. So we can't apply to the river um, what we would apply to Tobo and that is, those are the jurisdictional concerns that I have is that we, if we, we make a mistake if we generally apply. That's how we run a foul state preemption of the two 
things. I don't believe that, I have not seen anything in this proposal that leads me to believe that the county attorney's office does not have an understanding of their jurisdictional uh, authority, or our jurisdictional authority to legislate specifically here. The, um, the, uh, oh God, I had one more thing. Oh, the, I had a question about, about the motion to strike. What does the motion to strike do functionally, because I don't have it in front of me, um, to the friendly amendment that we're looking at of laying out the authority of the, of the, of the, of the director? So the motion to strike is the only amendment before the uh, commission. It's been motioned and seconded. Mm -hmm. If it passes, then the provisions in the, um, in the proposed ordinance, ordinance related to the ability of the director to promulgate rules and regulations will be stricken. So there would be, we would essentially be you. neutering the friendly amendment before we got the friendly amendment yeah. there is amended no in. Yeah, there's no friendly amendment. So if the, like, all right, hypothetically, yeah. we motion to strike. Yes. Then we move to, then we want to lay out with the, 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 the friendly amendment that's been discussed and we want to lay out the duties of, of this director. We don't have a code, we have, we, have we made that harder? I don't, I don't, that's, that's my question. Hypothetically, if we vote to strike, then we move to a friendly amendment to lay out the duties of the director. Have we, how does that functionally work? That's, you can do I'm a motion. About it. Sure. So I think the, the goal of the friendly amendment and the goal of striking or trying to accomplish the same thing to the original proposal. If the motion to strike completely fails, I fully support the idea of the friendly amendment. Um, right now, current day is why we're here today, the way the proposal, mm -hmm. without changing anything, if he wanted to make a change, he would need to come to our body. I would not leave it like that while I'm supporting striking it completely. If, if we were to, assuming that striking it completely gets voted down, then I guess the next move would be for the friendly am amendment, which I support because it still lays out a line, but it stops short of the county commission. The, appro the approval would be the county manager and the county attorney, and it would stop there, um, which I think is still a lot better than the way it reads currently. It stops solely with the director, so if that helps. I could not have said it better myself, <laughs> so I agree with that. Thank you. So he, we have a motion to second what I think Commissioner Walker is saying, if his motion fails that he'll be open to the if a motion was made for the friendly amendment to put the other protections in that he would agree to that um so we do have a motion second uh to strike uh commissioner watkins's motion uh we're going to take a vote on that all in favor of his motion to strike please say aye i heard two people three uh, all opposed nay okay now we are back to the original motion and uh commissioner lucas you like to make that friendly motion, or you want me to make it? Time? Yeah, I know about it. You know about it. My time. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so at this time, I'd like to make a, a, a friendly amendment to the motion that we um, allow the, before any rule is promulgated by the director, that they first contact the county manager and county attorney to render an opinion um, of whether or not he's legally can do that. Uh, we can ask them to, to copy all of the commissions with that. So if you want to have input prior to that, prior to that decision to be made, we can do that. Uh, the attempt is not to get around the commission, it's just to expedite the process uh, and, and try to save lives if we can. So uh, in that form of that motion, and, and we can write it out uh, if need to be, um, I'd offer a friendly amendment. Can I get a second? Second by Commissioner Howell. Discussion on that friendly amendment, Commissioner and, Jones? And we'll have the language for next. So, so my only concern is, and, and, and it's the same current concern I had with Commissioner Watkins' uh, strike, with all due respect. I don't want to lessen. We all, we, I think we all concur this is not all we want it to be, but at least it's a positive move in the right direction. Then we can revisit it and enhance it with these other things that I think we all share the concern. So with this friendly amendment language you're talking about, Mayor, so I don't want him to be in a situation where he says, okay, uh, we, I have an emergency here. I've got to send it up the ladder, and, and, and that's not going to be done in a timely manner. So that's my concern. Um, can I respond to that? Yeah. 
and, I, and I'm not going to speak for, for uh, Ms. Davis, but given what has been our, talked about in terms of the legal issues, and sometimes it's unclear who has jurisdiction, who doesn't, I would recommend this amendment and we can expedite the response um, because what you don't want is him doing something in good faith and with right. serious, sincere intent that he can't do. So I, I think this is a, 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 a proper All right, since it's coming from you, I'll, I'll, trust, your, <laughs> I'll trust your advice and go with it. All right. Thank you. I'd like to add that subsection C says if any provision of this section or any rule or regulation promulgated by the director is in genuine conflict with state or federal law, the conflict shall be resolved in accordance with law. That's a catch-all provision um, that protects us legally from the exact uh, worries that y'all are having about conf when we're talking about jurisdictional conflicts. Commissioner Tillman, did you have a question? I'm sorry. I was going to make another comment that this is really unusual for us to sit here and have this longer discussion without the director here uh, and we're trying to speak for him on his behalf and um, you know it, it's, it's just unusual that you know you, you want to support this and, and, and to implement these changes because that issue last year where all those folks were dumped in the water, went to the hospital and lost their life happened over a year ago. So, you know, what prompted this all of a sudden is a lot of questions, although it needs to be put in place. But, you know, it's like we can't even talk to the directors or the folks that that's concerned about this anymore. Well, the director, and, and director is represented here, Commissioner Tim, I, I, but for I personal you, reasons, I, he's I, unable I, to be here today. Okay, okay. Okay. Commissioner Watkins. All right. I guess just for my clarity, and uh, at this point, I'm going to vote for it to keep, keep us moving. But just what are the, like, we, we, we've talked about safety and saving lives. And the rules that I'm seeing are we want to make sure that 14 year olds are under 14 or they're supervised. And if you have an altercation, you can be removed. What is happening at the lake um, as it relates to, I guess, is there just hordes of underage youth being dropped off every day or what's happening? Uh, it's happening exactly well. I think somebody summarized earlier you're at the pavilion having a good time and you let your child, you know, I'm not trying to throw anybody in the bus, but hypothetically, somebody could let their child uh, go there and be babysitting in the water for a while thinking they're safe when in actuality they're not, or they're right there on the beach not watching the child and let a three-year-old go in there and drown. Uh, and, and certainly, we're just trying to be cautious and, and making sure we can address that in any kind of way we can. And I think doing nothing is not an option. And this, this ordinance here was proposed. Um, of course, anybody in this commission could have proposed these, the, all these things in the last two years to make any of these changes that we had here. But this was particularly asked for by this director uh, after we had the drowning of the, the young child, and that's why it's more focused to the youth. Uh, it was already on the books, prepared for a vote, all the information sent out prior to the latest instance we have where, where the gentleman lost his life without a um, life jacket on on a tube. So I certainly, it's, it's something that we're going to revisit uh, in the near future, but I think uh, we do ourselves a disservice by uh, getting technical on a lot of these issues instead of giving them the tools we need to work with and trusting the process for a few weeks. So, uh, Commissioner Lucas, do you have a follow-up before we vote? Yes, I, I do support this. I think we've come full circle to where I wanted us to be. Uh, laws are put in place whether you have a good person in the position or a bad person. It's to let them know what their parameters are within that that particular job. And so I think um, the procedures that are in place, if I'm hearing correctly, where if someone proposes um, the changes, whoever the director may be there, because it, it won't be this person, uh, it, we're dealing with the position. Right. And so um, this uh, gives a process for, and my main, main concern is you don't give any one person that kind of power because people are not perfect. And so you have some other folks that that person would bring proposed changes to, and that is what I wanted to make sure was in place. So I can, I can support this. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Lucas. We do have a motion second on the friendly amendment. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion has amended. Okay. 
Uh, same thing, the motion as amended. Uh, we have a motion. Can I get a motion? Second. Motion by Mayor Project Cart, second by Commissioner Lucas. Uh, any discussion on that? Here, no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to the consent agenda for next week. Uh, also, uh, members, we're here at um, 7C. And before we move on there, I'd like to uh, make a motion that we move the executive session up uh, to now. Go ahead and enter executive session. I do expect a lengthy executive session. Uh, and we can have a working lunch at the same time. Uh, the lunch has arrived. We have our executive session and lunch. So I'd entertain a motion to moving that up to this part of the order. I have a motion. I do have a second by Commissioner Tillman. Uh, any uh, uh, any position otherwise on that motion? Here in nine, uh, we're going to go ahead and go in executive session for purpose or change the agenda to move it up to this item. Uh, and we're going to go in executive session for a consultation with attorney, county attorney, or other legal counsel to discuss pending or potential litigation, settlement claims, administrative proceedings, all those allowed by law, and published in the executive session comments. Uh, can I get a motion to go into executive session? Motion by Commissioner Wilder, second by Commissioner Bronson. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. We're now in executive session.
All right, time is now 2.02. Can I get a motion to come out of executive session? Motion by Mary Tim Protein Clark, second by uh, Lyle Bronson over there. Uh, any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. All right, we're now out of executive session, and it's still early. It's 2.02. Uh, we have Attorney McNeil in front of me for some reason. Let me see where we're at. <laughs> he doesn't even know. <laughs> okay, I think we're at a C. Is that right? That's right. Something about sick leave, which I'm about to have to use in just a minute. All right. An ordinance of the Macon Bibb County Commission to amend Section 8.05 of the Macon Bibb County Government Policies and Procedures Manual entitled Sick Leave Bank for the purpose of incorporating changes to firefighter schedules into the county sick leave policy. That's my motion. Can I get a second? Second by May, uh, Mallory Jones. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Uh, we do have a question already, I think. No, we don't. Okay. Um, we have a motion and second. We do have our attorney standing before you. If you'd like for him to say some words, that'll be fine. Uh, apparently, Commissioner Lucas wants some more pain, so go ahead, Mr. McNeil. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is uh, this item and the next item are the first of a, a series of uh, legislative items that we'll be bringing to uh, y'all over the next several months. There is a uh, committee consisting of a few department heads in the HR department that is uh, s just working through the entire policy handbook and uh, wanting to get things up to date, make sure that our policies match our practices and things like that. So um, these are just a couple of items that uh, uh, were recommended to be addressed uh, as initial matters. Um, this commission voted last December to amend the firefighter work schedule to have three shifts and a 27 day rotation. Uh, also voted in February to amend the county sick leave policy to allow employees to take uh, sick leave time for uh, mental health reasons or for seeking mental health treatment. And uh, the county also has a policy in our handbook called the sick leave bank policy, which allows uh, people who accrue more than two weeks of sick leave, they can join the sick leave bank by donating a day of time. And then if they ever uh, completely exhaust their sick leave time, then they can uh, withdraw time from this bank to make sure that they have additional sick leave to make sure if there's some sort of accident or a prolonged illness, they can continue to uh, get paid while they recover. Um, that policy as it stands right now does not reflect the new firefighter work schedule and does not reflect the use of uh, sick leave time for mental health purposes. And so this amendment would uh, incorporate those two things um, to say that the, the firefighters, uh, for example, are on a 54 hour a week schedule, whereas before it said 60 hour a week schedule. Um, and it also talks about if you have, uh, for example, uh, a, a mental health incident that requires uh, inpatient care, prolonged inpatient care that's over five days, you can use your sick leave bank time for that as opposed to just a hospitalization for physical illness or injury. Um, and so that's, that's the uh, the gist of the policy, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. About Thank you, Attorney McNeil. Uh, Commissioner Lucas? Uh, yeah, I am just totally in favor of um, the sick leave bank. When I was employed with the Bibb school system, uh, I was a member contributed hours that I had accumulated to the sick leave bank. My, and so, and some people who were very ill and exhausted, their sick leave were able to borrow from that sick leave bank. My question is, uh, does the person have to be a member and contribute to the bank in order to receive, yes, uh, to borrow? Yeah, okay, well that was good. That was the only thing I was going to ask, but I, I endorse this because uh, everybody doesn't have the same life situations and some people, you know, have some illnesses that involve extended periods of time so that's very beneficial and i'll support this thank you commissioner lucas can i put you down as a co-sponsor would you co-sponsor that yes okay yes i think commissioner bronson and others would like to do so also we do have a motion and second there's no further questions all those in favor of the motion please say aye, aye. opposed nay that motion uh, carries and we sent the consent agenda item d is a uh Ordinance the Macon Bibb County Commission to amend Section 2-17 and 2-18 Macon Bibb County Code of Ordinances and Section 2.04 of the Macon Bibb County Government Policies and Procedures Manual for purposes of clarifying the nepotism policy for the county government. Uh, that's my motion. Can I get a second? Second by Mayor Pro Tim Clark. 
And I, likewise, I'd ask our attorney uh, to give a brief, brief um, update on this policy. We have asked them to look at these, so we'll bring back uh, a new chapter every month for our handbook uh, for each of you so we can digest uh, this one at a time uh, and go through this on a monthly basis. Uh, this particular policy I asked them to look at because in the challenging environment that we've got today, uh, in particular public safety and other positions filling, we need to cast a wide net and get as many folks as we can uh, involved in the process. At the same time, we're mindful of all kind of ethical policies and other policies we have of people who uh, are supervisory over others in their, in their same department. So we asked them to look at ways that we can be uh, less restrictive um, and still be able to hire folks. For example, in our current policy, if we had someone that wanted to be a firefighter, um, they wouldn't be able to be a firefighter if they um, had a relative that worked in the IT department. And that, to me, is something that is, is too prohibited. Uh, and I think there's many instances you have that. And as you, as you know, public safety and firefighters, if you look through all other kind of counties across the United States, uh, it's truly brotherhood and sisterhood. And a lot of times you have multiple family members uh, working in those situations. And I think it's something that we ought to encourage it from every department. Uh, the, the particular rule here, there's no situations that have to come before that the mayor would be able to point someone in his direct within I guess three uh, relationship there for any appointed position that has to go for. We have rules and guidelines with all that, but certainly um, we don't want to prohibit people from working from making Bibb County when we need a uh, good uh, workforce here just because of their peer relationship with somebody of one of 1,600 people that we have and employed on a full or part-time basis in making. So I'll let uh, Attorney McNeil uh, make a few remarks in regards to that. And I know I see Commissioner Tillman's light on uh, in, this, in this case as well. And so, um, um, as Mayor pointed out, there is a current nepotism policy that's in our handbook. Um, it, it derived from the uh, nepotism rule that's in our county charter, which uh, breaks down, basically there's three rules that are in our charter. First, the mayor and commission uh, can't appoint any uh, relatives within three degrees of relation uh, to any position. That, that would be anything that you have to do a, an appointment and a confirmation process on, whether like board appointments or department head positions. Uh, that's in our charter. Secondly, it says that um, board members uh, and department heads cannot hire their own relations to uh, work for them. And so, um, you know, if you have somebody that is on, uh, for example, one of our advisory boards, pedestrian safety, or uh, one of the pension boards, they can't hire their own relatives, and our department heads can't hire their own relatives to work within their departments. That's the second rule that's in our charter. The third rule is where we run into some interpretive uh, question. It says, uh, nor, nor shall any person hereafter be appointed or employed in any capacity on behalf of the restructured government who is so related to the person appointing or employing him or her. And so our, our code interprets employing, or I'm, I'm sorry, not our code, our uh, policy handbook interprets employing very, very broadly, essentially um, um, covers the entire commission, the, uh, the mayor, the mayor's staff, and also, as Mayor mentioned, there's a list of several departments, such as finance, IT, HR, where if you have any relatives working in any of those departments, you are completely barred from working for the county government in any capacity. Um, that, is, that is far more restrictive than our charter requires. And so the purpose of this amendment is to um, um, relax that provision to be consistent with what the charter requires. And the way this does it, um, the nepotism policy is in our code right now in subsection J of the ethics rules. Um, this pulls that out, makes it its own section, um, and requires that uh, first, as I mentioned, uh, the mayor and the commissioners cannot appoint relatives to appointed positions. That's, that's board uh, positions and directorships. Uh, that, that stays the same. Uh, second, department heads and board members cannot hire their own relatives. That stays the same. But for the provision about uh, who is employing whom, um, which is on page four of this ordinance, it is um, paragraph four, reduces that just to the people that are in the chain of command uh, within that person's department, so you're not having direct supervisory or managerial oversight over, over your own relatives, um, or to people who are making hiring, termination, salary, assignment, promotion, or disciplinary decisions about that person. Um, and so to the extent that uh, maybe you're applying to be on one work crew, but there's another crew leader that is called in to do the interviews with you, you can't be related to that crew leader who's deciding who to pick out of a, a pool of interviewees. 
Um, and then um, lastly, there's an exception that says anyone that's just working in a volunteer capacity, in an internship capacity, or in a non-permanent position up to 20 weeks uh, per year, they're not, they're not considered employed under this, um, this provision just for people that want to work in temporary or seasonal uh, positions. Um, so that's, that's the overview. Um, I'll be happy to take any specific questions um, that anybody has. Thank you, Attorney McNeil. Uh, Commissioner Tillman? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this uh, here, uh, we appreciate it, is long, long overdue. Uh, we first uh, implemented this back in January of 2014, a nepotism uh, uh, ordinance and, and rule that has not been fair and played fair to many. Uh, I was encouraged to uh, change this. I did not. Uh, my son, who served in Iraq, uh, was uh, uh, solicited by the Human Resource Director at the time to come here and go through this process. I ran for office in 2013, was not in office. He went through all the processes to become a firefighter and in the end was told because I had been elected uh, as elected official that he could no longer serve, which the human resource director knew up front. Uh, he t himself was in violation and I just want to point out a few to how this here would, would change and work that I never brought out uh, publicly but behind the scenes with the compliance officer who was Attorney Judd at the time, had a meeting and uh, we uh, were considering a lawsuit. Uh, we uh, later discovered that the former fire chief and the human resource director was related and had been related for years uh, in violation of this nepotism law. The human resources director and a police sergeant was related who had been in violation for many years. Animal control director who had hired her son was in violation of this nepotism uh, law. Uh, that was in place that uh, was in violation. Uh, a county commissioner had two sons, one served on E911 and one served as a firefighter, was in violation. And this same human resource director uh, allowed this to happen. The procurement, former procurement director, uh, uh, who we had for Macon Beale County, and the sheriff neighborhood uh, watch, the police neighborhood watch uh, coordinator, was mother and son. Uh, and so these things continued to happen uh, over the years, and it was selective as to uh, how they implemented the nepotism rule and law. And so uh, I'm glad to see that this uh, new nepotism is in place because we know that Macon Bill, uh, a city of only 150 to 60,000, has many uh, family, friends, and folks that's related. So I was up 2 o'clock this morning looking at this specific language and trying to understand some of the, these wordings in it. And if you look at some of these descendants, it is one of the words I actually looked up, that uh, any of us sitting around this horseshoe, or many of us, uh, could take a DNA test and be surprised that maybe 10% of us could all be related. And so the nepotism law uh, ha has, has failed us in the sense uh, of, of of that in, in itself. Uh, this city, Macon Bill County, just too small of a town that people are going to work together. And I just appreciate, we don't often give this administration uh, enough credit and kudos, and even sometimes this mayor folks get offended. Uh, but this is a good one uh, to bring forward to dispel some of those things that's been happening and where we need folks to work for Macon Bill County because. Uh, for whatever reason, a lot of folks are, are out all around uh, this country. Folks are not willing to work. And so I think this is going to open up the doors for a lot of folks, and I just applaud and I appreciate this. And uh, notice I didn't call their names, but I called positions, uh, and that was intentional today. Thank you, and y'all be blessed. <laughs> uh, thank you, Commissioner Tillman. I, I, somewhere along those lines, I think you indicated that we're related. So. Uh, <laughs> I can hire you to work somewhere, but I can't appoint you anywhere. Uh, I appreciate everyone. Uh, if, if, if you want to co-sponsor, <laughs> if you want to co-sponsor this bill, I do think it's going to help in our workforce and certainly going to help in morale in several places. And we're still going to be bound by our ethical guidelines. And I um, appreciate any co-sponsors that want to add on to that. We do have a motion in second. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to the consent agenda. Item 8A is an appropriation. It's an ordinance of making Bibb County Commission to authorize a supplemental budget appropriation for general fund fund balance to the Capital Improvements Fund, IT, for computers and hardware line item 
an amount of $125,000 to provide additional funding to the purchase of media system improvements for the Macon Bibb County Commission chambers that we're in. We're in. Uh, these are certainly needed, and, and as uh, we put this out in our CIP, I believe, later uh, in the past, it came up a little short because of the funding um, has gone up on pricing, and this uh, addendum is needed here to add this to the balance so we can get uh, the technology like we need to in this particular room right here. So uh, we're certainly, uh, I guess there's some interest here, and some people I see some eyes wide open there. Um, we hope that you, this passes, and at this time I entertain a motion for approval. Motion by Commissioner Bronson. We have a second. Second by Commissioner Jones. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Also, I want to remind commissioners we have a work session today at 2.30. Uh, it's about 2.15, 2.20 now. Item B is an ordinance of the Macon Bibb County Commission to authorize a supplemental budget appropriation from the general fund, fund balance of the capital improvements fund, fire vehicles line item in the amount of $265,018 to provide additional funding for the purchase of a new fire engine. Uh, we estimated the amount last time. Prices had gone up. Uh, as well as the amenities on these, these fire trucks. So the additional money that we needed for the fire truck is $265,018. Uh, can I get a motion to approve? Motion by Commissioner Bronson, second by Commissioner Lucas. Any further discussion? Excuse me? Yes, ma'am. Is that what I said? Okay. <laughs> I, I, they know that you're going to support everything that comes over there. <laughs> Commissioner Bronson, you got something? Put the truck back up. Commissioner Bronson would like to see that fire truck again. Has it got your name on it or something? Hold on. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sure the chief will be uh, happy to know that you're going to approve the fire, fire truck. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries to be sent to consent agenda. Item C is the ordinance of making Bibb County Commission authorize a supplemental budget for general fund, fund balance of the capital improvement fund recreation, property line item amount of $145,000 to provide additional funding for the purchase of lighting at Carolyn Creighton Park. Uh, instead of putting this in the CIP, which is going to be coming soon to you, for a bunch of our capital improvements, we're in a tight window to get all this work done before the next cherry blossom and other events we've got coming on at Carroll and Creighton Park. So we'd like you to go ahead and put this on this agenda uh, today to do that. Uh, we'll entertain a motion and a second, and then we'll move on for any discussion. I get a motion to approve this. A motion by Commissioner Tillman, second by Commissioner, who was that, Bronson. Uh, question by Commissioner Watkins. Did these baseball or softball lights or? No, sir. Th this is for the park itself where there's uh, Areas uh, in the first two places up there by the water and to the front. Oh, the park's going to start being open after 8 o'clock? Uh, they'll be lit uh, during that period of time. Uh, right now, there's there's no additional time that's been created, but when we get into the cherry blossom, typically it does get dark down there, uh, and you've got a lot of wires and stuff running down there uh, on, on the ground. The the ball fields is a separate instance there. we got uh, the fields and that ready to go. We're waiting on some... Uh, uh, Georgia Power is working on moving some power sources for there to make that happen, uh, and all the fencing and the powers. Um, I guess the uh, lighting is already there. We're just waiting on the power connect. So this is on the front section. Yeah, but no, I'm all for lighting. I think lighting makes communities safer. Yes, sir. Glad we can be creating a safer park area. And so, if I'm understanding this right, we're this is not going on existing poles. We're putting up the poles and the lights. Four, four new poles. Four right. new poles. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, this is for four, four new poles? Yes, sir. These, these are the large, it's going to carry a large area, and then we got uh, permission from the owner to put them up. Any other questions? We do have a motion and a second. No further questions. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Item nine is a uh, another installation of street lights. This is a resolution of making Bibb County Commission approving Petition for installation of 28 street lights in the Oakview subdivision pursuant to Article 10, Chapter 29 of the Macon Bibb County Code of Ordinance to be paid from the facilities management budget services to government electricity line item. We do have our attorney come up here. I believe that this particular petition was done. They had underground power uh, only there, and this subdivision um, agreed to furnish and pay for all 28 poles. Correct, sir. The uh 
the community HOA put in a petition for several street lights throughout the development. However, when facilities management went out to do their lighting survey, they realized that there were no above ground power poles. So the petition itself was rejected by facilities management. The neighborhood association contacted Georgia Power, had the 28 power poles installed with wiring to allow for the lighting and recontacted facilities management to revisit their petition. Now that the poles have been installed, the petition meets the requirements according to our facilities management department to refer to this body for review. Okay, and do you know the amount, is it 65% of the parcels have to agree on this petition? According to the Making Move Code of Ordinances, section 29-202, Subsection D, affected parcels, since that's a key term we need to talk about in this, definite, in this explanation, refers to properties within a 300 foot radius of any street light to be installed. If an individual or an HOA petitioning for a street light, if they are only asking for one light, 100% of the property owners within that 300 foot radius have to agree to the installation. Sir? Yeah. Okay, keep on. And if it is more than one street light, 65%. Okay. Excuse, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to try to finish and I'll, I'll, I'll let you. Percent of the property owners must agree to the installation of the street lights. Now, is that property owners where there's a home and a resident there, or does that count parcels that are empty? That counts. All properties. Okay. And Commissioner Watkins, you have a question? You. Are you? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Well, we have a motion and a second. I'm not sure of any other questions, so we'll be taking a vote. So we have a motion and a second. There's no further uh, questions regarding this. Um, we do have a motion and a second. I'm sorry. My, my bad. Let me get a motion and a second first. I got ahead of myself. I'd like to make a motion for approval. Can I get a second? Got a second by Mayor Pro Tem Clark. Now, Commissioner Watkins, you have a follow up? I guess some of the stuff that was bothering me about this code, like and, and mm -hmm. salutes to the Oakview neighborhood for putting this together. <clears throat> um, for some, for some, the 65 percent and the hundred, I guess I'm asking for, and what I'm, I'm totally for Oakview getting, getting their lights. Don't want to stop that at all. But I do want us to just slow down on this and take a moment to appreciate the process that they go through. Because just not like in that 65 and 100%, uh, this is a fully occupied, fairly new neighborhood. But imagine a cul-de-sac that's shot out with vacant houses, burned down houses, and it's just two people living on that street actively. And those two people don't even own the house, they're renters. The street's dark. In order for them to get a street light based on this petition, they need to get 100% or 65% of vacant lots, burned down lots, people that are not even paying us taxes. And even if you own and the owner of the house, because just knocking on the door of the person who lives there is not enough under our, in our, under our code section. Like the, the, the impacted owners, property owners, is a hurdle that I would ask at some point that we can do away with it should in my opinion it should be something closer to folks who live work or reside there um, versus the ownership because a vacant lot or a burned down property counts in that they were able to get to the tip of 75 70 or 65 percent on some of them but they were very close and it's not an easy thing to do so but anyway thank you mr watkins uh, mayor project car Commissioner, did you send, you sent a, a proposed update to the code section around? Um, I, I, if there, if it's possible, and I know we're we take, I agree that we need to slow down and look at this thing. It, I'd like some of the, I would like to consider those. I mean, I, I would make a motion to to add that to the agenda, those updates to the agenda to consider. And if we get to a point where we need to table and come back, I'd be I'd be open to doing that right now. I know we've had a long day, but I do think you had very reasonable additions proposed. If that's something that you would like, I just I, I thought that's what you were about to do. I don't want to ask you to do that, but if you don't want to, I will. <laughs> I, I think you're you're talking about some language that he struck through. I think I think 
the, the, I've, I got a copy of that email, but I understand that some of that was wasn't entirely correct on the, what we're talking about now with 165 and all, all that stuff. I, I'm certainly open to a new policy, and I hope that y'all can draft one that everybody can agree to, but I don't want to uh, – this is not one of those urgent needs where we have to do this. Um, certainly uh, the policy, I believe, is outdated and antiquated, and I think that it needs some improvement. But I, I think we need to have a little bit uh, more input from everyone to come up with a good policy like we're working on with roads today uh, to move the process along since we, we, we have grown. We have uh, certain parts of the community that are more lit than others, and we have a lot of communities that don't want more light. Uh, and I think that's why the policy was put in place. But I, I'd rather uh, have a, a group of uh, commissioners working on a policy that we can get a good consensus on before we – put something on and take it off just just personal preference okay I'd, I'd love commissioner to for you and me to sit down anybody else I don't care but I just just to get I think we're gonna keep go, getting to the point I think the I think the petition is rather onerous and um, and I, I I think if we can sit down and get something to add to the agenda either for next week or the beginning of August I think I think to Commissioner Lucas's point earlier I don't want to revisit it and I do see this is sort of a you know it's it's uh, it's it's something shiny within the code section that we're dealing with right now and it's just a reminder that we need to do it and I just kind of would like I, I, I like some of your ideas and would like to work with you on them to get something in front of this board soon thank, you, today. thank you Mayor for time Mr. Watts do you have a follow-up I, I tell you I just got so accustomed to getting tabled here and and, and shook the side that I did not have printouts ready <coughs> but uh yeah I'll be more than happy to review it uh, at a later date I appreciate you guys working I, I do think it's a, a valuable asset when we can um treat all the communities uh, equitably at the same time we, we have to make sure that we we know the approximate cost i know commissioner watkins have asked for some of that information it's hard to detail when we do in our budgets every year uh it certainly would work as far as our mvp program to have some of our most challenged areas uh, more lit uh in, in a good sense and then we can um we can take it from there so i look forward to what y'all may bring back and i, I if you don't mind it, it would be helpful for me if you include me in the early processes in case I may have some input as well uh, on it. Um, so I look forward to doing that and hopefully in the next month, but I think it's uh, promising. Uh, regarding this particular item, uh, we need to get a motion and second. We got a motion and second, we need to take a vote. Uh, if there's no further questions on the installation of lights of the Oakview subdivision, I'd entertain a motion and we got a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries will be sent to consent agenda. Our last item before the work session is a resolution of Macon Bibb County Commission authorizing Bragg Jam Inc., a nonprofit organization, to hold its 2022 concert crawl in downtown Macon, Georgia, on Saturday, July 30th, 2022, to permit festival goers to carry and consume alcoholic beverages in and about the designated streets of downtown Macon under specified conditions. Uh, this is something we have to do each and every year to continue this. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve? Who is that? Motion for Commissioner Bronson. We have a second. Second for Mayor Proton Clark. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. At this time, we're not going to adjourn the meeting. We've already had our lengthy executive session. I don't think there's a need to go back in the executive session, but we will leave the meeting open, but we're going to retire into the, uh, the uh, mayor's conference room for a work session on roads, uh, which is scheduled to begin right about now, and uh, we'll adjourn at the completion of that meeting. Thank you.